Would you believe I'm actually rather nervous about doing this review? There's so many, so many things you can say, and yet at the same time, you could keep going on and on for a long time about something you really care about, can't you? One of the things I was commenting to a friend of mine when preparing for this review was how I was going to try not to be discussing the game at length. And by at length, I mean truly at length, as in I'd be here all night and then my, re my, my replacement would show up at the end of my shift and I'd still be sitting here talking. And the reason that's interesting to me is I'm not talking about rambling. I'm not talking about idle conversation. I'm talking about genuine discussion and exploration of the game and all its themes and matters and, and substance for, for hours upon hours upon hours. And I'm going to try very hard not to do that. But at the same time, <laughs> I will be going over several things uh, to the, the greatest extent that I, I can do so, that I can feel I can do so. One of my commenters, several of my commenters actually, have, have basically either asked directly in private messages or mentioned in comments, you know, what more can be said about this game? What more could be, could be put forth about Final Fantasy VI? I already did two reviews about it, uh, effectively. And the truth of the matter is that Final Fantasy VI is one of a very small number of games that I believe actually deserves multiple reviews in such a manner. Deserves to be talked about more than once. Deserves to be reviewed more than once. Des is more than worthy of the fact that I'm going to be sitting here talking about it for hours upon hours upon hours on end, have, and have already done so. So, I beg you your indulgence in this matter. But the very first thing I want to do here is I want to go over a quote that I have mentioned before and I will probably mention again because it's just one of my favorite quotes. This is from Nobuo Mitsu regarding Final Fantasy VI. I still remember when, during the launch party for Final Fantasy VI, the notoriously unforgiving Mr. Sakaguchi gave a speech. Thanks to every one of you, we have created the best game in the world. No, in the universe. Thank you. I cried. There were tears on my face, and those tears made me realize just how much I had invested myself in the project. I hope that the Final Fantasy games forever continue to be a source of joy, not only for the fans, but the, for the developers as well. There's something to be said about the sheer passion and effort and heart and emotion that went into games like this, especially this game. This was the the critical point when they... FF6, as many have pointed out, is the time when they started doing a lot of the more modern things that would take over from the PlayStation era and onward, but it still had a very large amount of the classic things that, that were prevalent within, you know, 4 and 5 in the previous games. It was literally at the cusp, right here, between these two worlds, these two styles of Final Fantasy games. And by some sheer miracle, Final Fantasy VI actually managed to create with itself a perfect combination of both of these worlds, an actual true hybrid, you know what I mean? All of the benefits, none of the detriments, all of the good sides of both sides combined into one. And it was it's an absolutely amazing game. I've made a little bit of a list here, and here, and here to go through. So let's start with this list, shall we? Final Fantasy VI was one of the last games Hironobu Sakaguchi, who I was just mentioning, really worked with. It was uh, a sort of a unique game as far as his his credits go, because Sakaguchi obviously helped write Final Fantasy I being the story guy back then, but since then he's basically been the director, the producer, the creative individual, basically, someone who has an oversight, and, and indeed has creative oversight, which is the actual term for it, but hasn't been involved in the details. However, he was actually a writer, and arguably, it, the accounts vary, but it is arguable that he was the writer for Final Fantasy VI, that this was the game that he sat down and said, okay, this is the last game I'm really putting myself into, let's really try here. Now, it wasn't actually the last game. Hironobu actually had some work to do in uh, Final Fantasy VII as well, but VII was his actual last game, the last one he really did anything in. He, he got credit on, on further games, but you get what I'm saying here. And 
it's it's just very interesting to me to mention that it's it's one of those little things that it's just interesting. It's not quite trivia per se. It's more of a how things came to be. To know that he put forth that level of effort and and time and thought into the game, and everyone did, is just fascinating. You know, one of the uh, one of the other things that is worth mentioning here is that this is one of the first games where Tetsuya no- Nomura really had a a strong influence. He had been working with the FFs uh, sometime previously as a monster designer, actually, as as an artist. But in FF6, he was given just a tiny little bit of freedom in order to actually work with character design and, and a few additional things because he'd been wanting to expand. And for those of you who don't recognize the name, he is basically the guy behi- behind the Kingdom Hearts series, or rather, the actual good parts of the Kingdom Hearts series. You know, all of the in-depth plot and the story that goes behind it, all of the the brand new characters, including, you know, obviously Xehanort, the organization, um, Sora, I guess. You know, all the, all of that is was was basically his his baby, his his child, his 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 uh, work, and so that gentleman who has also done a lot of other really good work, I just feel like pointing out. But nevertheless, that gentleman basically got his first real start, his first real break in this game because he was they he was told, okay, we're going to give you one character and you can design him, and he put together Setzer. Now. He didn't do all of the characterization. He didn't do all of the writing. He didn't do all the backstory. A lot of that was handled by the other staff, including, of course, Mr. Sakaguchi. But he wa- he did have influence and, and say in the matter. And one of the reasons why Setzer is such an interesting character is is because he worked with him. So I just feel like note- noting that there. Now, I know I'm getting a little bit dry here. <sighs> That's partially because I-, I might be gushing by the end of this video, and I want to try and, you know, prep you. You need to be all spongy. Um... Another thing I want to mention here is that <laughs> Final Fantasy VI, everything they wanted to do in FF4, I mentioned this before, they had to cut content, everything they wanted to do about it, all, and all everything they did uh, created a sort of interesting... Uh, a unique storytelling perspective. I mentioned this all the way back in my Final Fantasy One review as well. This was something they did, uh, they've basically been doing since the beginning, because the limitations of the games and the systems have just been there that they can't say the entire story. They, they can't, so they have to imply a lot of it. And in FF4, they had basically moved that to the point where they were doing it not only intentionally and deliberately, but as, as sort of a, a, an art form, if I might say so. You know, they were doing it for the explicit purpose of of, dis- uh, of of expanding the game of of really getting the the point across of really enhancing the story enhancing the narrative and so i really enjoyed the way that that was working out in the games now ff6 of course took all of that and is in my opinion probably the single best example of that philosophy as with other things i have mentioned before there are certain mindsets uh Writ rules, both written and unwritten, that go into making a Final Fantasy that became actual, uh, you know, writ law as the FF series went on. This is one of those. This idea of using, of hinting at a story and a plot rather than actually saying it. FF six, I think, did the did it the perfect way because ninety percent of the hinting that went on, of the the set pieces, of the of of the little. I don't even know how to call it, the signpost thing, you know, where you see just enough in order to infer this is what's going on here. Almost all of that, 90% of it was done to enhance the the lore, the backdrop, the backstory to characters, and the setting itself, the world that this is taking place in. It was very, very, very rarely done with the actual main plot, and I think that was a good choice, a good decision. The main plot was discussed in its entirety rather out front and in the open with a few critical exceptions. And it worked brilliantly. If I might call out another game for doing this completely wrong, Final Fantasy IX, as much as I do enjoy that game a great deal, started using the set pieces thing, the the hint, the signpost method, for the actual main plot. And one of the reasons that that plot was so screwed up in the game itself, and they had to start explaining it in the Ultimania and things like that, was because of that of that design choice. And I personally think that was a mistake. I think FF6 had the uh, the perfect balance. It's also worth noting, you know, other FFs have, have of course done that, but as far as the perfect balance between how to use that particular method and actually discussing things and going into things, it is my opinion that FF6 did that the best. Now, one of the other things uh 
excuse me, that, that 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 really helped with is a lot of those set pieces, a lot of those signposts were completely optional. I'm not even talking about the World of Rune stuff. There's a bit of a story here I'll get into in a moment, but you know, I'm not even talking about the fact that virtually all the World of Ruin was an optional side quest, basically, and uh, and I'll get into that more in detail later. I'm not talking about the fact that there was a lot of uh, the explore points thing, which FF5 did as well, I mentioned, you know, linear on rails to a point, and then it kind of branches out, and you can do your thing, and then it branches out even more. FF6 had, I'll talk about pacing later, but FF6 had an interesting... Uh, approach to that, because in FF5, you get the first ship, which gives you a very small degree of freedom very early on. You get the dragon pretty quickly after that, you get the the other ship pretty quickly after that, you get the airship decently after that, you know what I mean? It was staggered, and each point opened up more exploration point and let you do more and have more freedom, but it was pretty linear as, as far as the progression goes. This, this was true even in the second and the third world. Excuse me, in Final Fantasy VI, you were on rails for actually a really long time, relatively speaking, all the way up until you com go to Narsh the second time. When the, the three parties have reconvened there, you have the first battle, and, and, and you know, the things happen, and blah, blah, blah. By the way, I'm going to say this right at the front. I've, I've mentioned this before in my videos. I'm going to mention this right now. If you have even the tiniest, slightest interest in this game, stop watching this video and go play it, please. I do not want to spoil the greatest game ever made, in my opinion, by simply talking about it so openly and so free freely like this. You know, I, I would love to just talk about the concepts and the execution, but I, uh, there's too much to talk about in the game itself. So I encourage you, I implore you indeed, to, to, to give this game at least a try, at least a shot. If you have the availability, I, I, I would say go ahead and get the GBA version, because the there were several conveniences tossed in, only a few, to be honest with you. But it also touched up the dialogue. The translation was done beautifully, and so much of the dialogue was cleaned up and, and fixed and made better. And on top of that, they did have additional content in that, which is awesome. So, you know, I'll talk about the remake, of course, later, as I usually do, I, but seriously. Okay. Now, if you're still watching, I can only assume you either don't care, <laughs> which is fine, or you already have played the game, which is probably 99% of my audience, because this is Final Fantasy VI. Now, the second thing, when you go to, to Narsh, to continue my sentence, when you go to Narsh and Terra has fled and, and just has, has turned into a monster, we have no idea what she is at this point in time, and is off doing her own thing, and you reconvene, that's the first real exploration point. It's not a big one, I'll admit that. And that's kind of my point. It takes forever to get to that first point of freedom, and then you're only given a little bit. You're given just a tiny bit, and then it's back to the rails, and you go... To, you go through a sequence of events, you know, Zozo, the uh, the Opera House, the Empire, go down to Vector, and then you have another sudden freedom point, and this is another small one. You can go to Miranda, you can go to Zen, and you can check out the base camp, and you can roam the continent. And then there's another pretty linear section until, well, I shouldn't even say it's even a section, it is Vector itself, and then you get the airship, and all of a sudden, after doing this, the whole game, as far as freedom, and we're, and this is quite a ways into the game, by the way, at this point, you know, we're well over halfway through the World of Balance, all of a sudden, boom, you get the airship, and you can go anywhere in the entire world, in the entire setting, there is, there's no limitation as of that point. You can go anywhere that exists in the world of balance, and there's going to be something to see, something to do in all of those places, and it was awesome. It was such a unique method of approaching it, because like I said, you know, FF4 had a, had a similar uh, pacing system to what FF5 did, you know. The, the this thing, the ladder method, basically. If we were looking at a chart here, and this is time, and this is level of freedom, it just kind of does this thing as it goes on. FF5, the exact same thing. FF6 did this, and then this. And it actually worked, and it's hard to explain why. The, the real way to explain it, and not many people are going to agree with me on this, so I apologize for the, for the bad analogy, but in World of Warcraft, they refused to allow you to do flying mounts. When, when they were first introducing the concept of flying mounts, Balkan Outland, the idea existed to have flying mounts much earlier on. Now, granted, Obviously, they couldn't do that because they would have to redo all of Old World, and that idea got shelled and killed Cataclysm. But it was on the table. It was something they considered. Do we enable the mounts to fly as soon as you get the mounts? And someone pointed out that the whole reason the mounts were not available at level 1 was so that the player could learn to appreciate that, if that makes any sense. Because the average person, myself included, will simply not appreciate the freedom and... and, and 
convenience and the features that, that it, it won't mean as much to us if we don't have a contrast to place against it. If we don't know what it's like to go without a mount or without a flying mount, if we don't have any understanding of that, then we'll just uh, consider this the norm and we won't appreciate or enjoy it as much. So Final Fantasy VI made us sit on rails for a very long time, so when they finally opened up the entire world, we would actually appreciate it. And, we, and, and many people I know uh, cherish that moment in FF6. You know, the moment they get the airship, first damn thing they do is go off and just start flying around. Yeah! Woo! Yeah! So then they start just going town to town, one by one, just, just visiting everywhere, going everywhere. And that's kind of my point, isn't it? That was a brilliant move, a brilliant narrative move, brilliant almost meta way of approaching it, because that is a perfect example of gameplay and story integration. The party gets the same freedom the players do at that point in time for the same reason, and it is restricted from the players as it is from the party for the same reason up to that point, because the party was basically struggling all the way up until that moment, and being several steps behind the villains right up until the time at which an airship suddenly became an availability, and all of the sudden, the, everything opened up just like it is for the players, because now all of a sudden we can go anywhere. You see what I'm saying with this? Brilliant move. Absolutely brilliant. Sorry, my throat's still sore from yesterday. It's probably going to be all this week. Um, uh, by the way, these are in no particular order, so I do apologize. I kind of wrote these down as I was thinking about the game at length, so apologies. Next thing I want to talk about is FF6 is one of the very only, is actually the only Final Fantasy to truly go off of the rails. For I've mentioned this term before. For anyone who doesn't know what I'm talking about, rails, it's actually what it sounds like. Train rails, right? Um, a, a railway. A, uh, you, know, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> I hope you know what that is. No, seriously, though. Uh, a story is on rail, a video game, and it has to be interactive, because it doesn't apply to anything else, but an interactive story, whether it be a tabletop game, a, a video game, or I guess that's it, basically, is considered to be on rails if you have no choice in the storyline. If you just, this is the pot path you go in the plot, and that's it, right? To illustrate by demonstration, and we're going to go to extremes here to really get the point across, Final Fantasy X which is a game I know at least most people are very aware of, is a game that is extremely on rails. It, the, the options of opening up do not happen until basically the end of the game. So the whole game, it's just, this is your path, right? And even if you deviate just a little bit, ultimately, if actually, we'll, we'll do this. If the, even if you're deviating, all you're doing is deviating on the path. You're still on the path. You're still going this way, you know what I mean? So... That's what on rails means. The, the, the exact opposite of that, to, to illustrate by contrast, would be virtually any Fallout and virtually any Elder Scrolls, actually any Elder Scrolls, you know. Yes, there is a main story, yes, there is a plot, yes, there is a, a, a progression to that, but, and here's the important part, what defines it as a non-rails game is the fact that as soon as you leave the tutorial, basically, as soon as you are introduced to the world, there is nothing preventing you from doing anything. If you so, if you understand what I'm saying here, in Final Fantasy, anything other than six, although six is also does so well, but you get my point. In in a game like that, in the Tales of is another excellent example. So it's Chrono Trigger, anything really. The Dragon Quests, you leave town, for example, you enter the overworld, and yes, you can go just about wherever. But in general, because of various limitations and the design of the map, you're going to have like one place you can actually go to. So you can roam the overworld in level, and then you can go to the next town. And these are your actual functional options. I'm not even talking about, you know, this is the places you should go. You could go over that town, but you might die, or you could go over to this cave, but it'll be closed. No, no, no. You actually can only actually functionally go to the town or roam around on the overworld map. You see what I'm saying here? That is on rails. And Final Fantasy VI is the only Final Fantasy to actually go off the rails, and it does that after the World of Ruin. The moment you get the airship, the Falcon, in the World of Ruin, that instant, after that that cutscene finishes playing, that beautiful music starts playing, and... Sorry. That, um... And, and Celis has her wonderful lines, and, and for the first time, you know, we get that hope spot. I'll talk about that scene more later, but anyways, at the moment you get that, and you're, you, the game is like, you know, you probably should go here. It does actually say that, you know, we see the path of the bird leading towards uh, Miranda, 
and the ship actually goes to Miranda, and then you're given control, and of that moment on, you are no longer restricted. They're, the rails have just vanished, and you can go anywhere and do anything. You could literally go from that spot to the last dungeon and fight the last boss, and, and, and there is a challenge associated with that, the, the four-man last boss challenge. It's actually much harder to do than it sounds, although I guess it actually sounds kind of hard to do, so shrug. Um... But you can do that if you really want to. If you have an interest in doing so, there you go, because the rails are gone. And FF6 is the only game to do that. You know, other FFs have had a sequence where you have a degree of option, uh, have of openness and, and availability to do optional stuff and do side quests and then go complete the mission. But never before has the entire world and indeed the main plot been optional in an FF. Excuse me, goodness. So, I personally think that was a good move. It's understandable why they didn't do it again. FF6 came out after Elder Scrolls had started, to give you a bit of perspective here. And the idea of an open-world RPG, what is usually referred to actually as a Western RPG, because most Western RPGs tend to be uh, more exploratory, less on rails than uh, Japanese RPGs do. It was an experiment. They wanted to try it. I personally think it worked beautifully, but... It is worth noting that there was some catches to it. There were some detriments to that concept. One of the things that was the biggest problem... Huh. One of the things that was the biggest problem was the fact that there wasn't a huge amount of guidance in what there was to do. Now, this is still a SNES game, which means that anywhere that you can go to on the map is going to have something happen to it, if you don't understand what I mean. So, exp while at the same time there was no real direction, you didn't have the problem that an Elder Scrolls or a Fallout did, where the world looms before you and you have only the vaintest idea of where to go for the main quest and no idea about where anything else is, because there's so much there. So, what I guess I'm saying is the fact that it was a SNES game worked in its favor in this case, because everywhere that is a, a explorable place on the map, you have an airship, so you can get there quickly, you can explore the map, and every single spot you can go to has something. All of them. 100% of them. And some of them will require you to go there after you go somewhere else, but generally it'll be obvious enough about about how to do that. And it encouraged exploration. The very first time you played F I still remember the very first time I played F6, and I got the airship. I, of course, did the did the cyan thing first because you know the, the hint was right there but the, the the fact of the matter is after that point all he did was mention gal and i'm like okay and i went and got gal and then the world loomed before me if you know what i'm saying here i, I did admittedly kind of follow the chain from cyan to gal to uh shadow because i had saved uh shadow obviously and then that's kind of it. That's kind of where the, the chain stops. After that, it was like, huh. And so there was something immensely enjoyable about being given the freedom to explore the world and being rewarded for it, while at the same time not having it be an absolute requirement, if you understand what I'm saying here. There was something about that mixture, that balance between those three points. The uh, I'll do the Triforce thing, but I don't feel like it. You, you know, there was something about that that really worked out very well and was just amazing. So... Next point here. I'll actually mention that basically last, because I mentioned uh, about the characters. The characters are basically their own topic. Let's move on. Let's talk about the theme of Final Fantasy VI. I mentioned uh, back in FF2 that all the FFs have had a theme. Sometimes this has been a requirement. Sometimes this has been because it's what they wanted. Hironobu Sakaguchi very much had a very strong idea for the theme of Final Fantasy VI. A lot of people are going to be confused by this when I say this, because the most commonly accepted theme of Final Fantasy VIII is love. But the problem is, the theme of Final Fantasy VI is love. Now allow me to explain. In Final Fantasy VI, every single individual, with one ex very important exception, which I will discuss much later, towards the end of this review, except for one being in the entire world, love, in all of its forms, is what is being expressed, discussed, shown, grown, um, broken, destroyed. You know, that is the central focus of every interaction throughout the entire game, as far as the NPCs and the characters and the, the individuals are concerned. And I say love because many people tend to forget that love is not simply romantic. 
we're talking about families, we're talking about friendships, we're talking about fellow soldiers, we're talking about people of an exceptional circumstance. You know, there's a there's a sort of camaraderie that is built among, say, the refugee mentality. If you are a refugee and someone else is a refugee, and you may be from different nations, you may be diff from different uh, of different skin color, different genders, different age group, it doesn't matter because there is this bond that forms when the two of you have suffered so and suffered together. And that is in itself, in my opinion, a form of love as well, a form of that interpersonal reaction, that connection. The whole of Final Fantasy VI is about the way we all fit together, the way we all interact with each other, the way we all care about each other. The, the, the ultimate message could best be described in the sentence that you are not alone. That in all of the world, you are not alone, and you don't have to face this by yourself because you have friends, you have family, you have loved ones, you have, have, have comrades in arm, you have like-minded circumstances, you have people, you have nations, you have towns, you have, you have neighbors. Uh, everything, every possible connective point was used throughout FF6 and done to to amazing degree. I want to stress again, we're not just talking about the playable characters here. We're talking about every character in the game. In many cases, several of them that don't even have names. And they still have that love expressed in some manner or another. That is the theme of Final Fantasy VI. And one of the reasons I love it so much, no pun intended, is because that theme, that message of you are not alone, that, that sentence has been one that has important, been important to me for many, many, many years, and is something that I feel personally should be reinforced here, you know, in, in, in life, in the world, and, oh my goodness, <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, I, I am going to be rather emotional during this video, and I make no apologies for that, unless I just said I'm sorry, I might have done it by habit, don't actually remember. Moving on. But that theme is so powerfully expressed, and it's done so with almost amusing subtlety. The only scene in the entire game that goes out of its way to actually hammer that point in and do so blatantly and bluntly is the scene where the entire party is gathered and facing Kefka in Kefka's tower. And, he, you know, Kefka gives that wonderful line, have you, have you found anything meaningful in this dead world of ours? And... I used to do a very good Kefka voice, I just... my throat. And, um... And Tara says, yes! And they go back, and every single party member, except Umaro and Gogo, because they were optionals, uh, I'll mention that in a minute, every single character, other than those two, says something about what it is that they have found, that they have learned over the course of this game, over the course of this journey, about themselves and about the people around them, and the way they all feel connected one to another. And... It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful scene because after all that heartwarmingness and and emotion, you could tell it actually does reach Kefka. You could tell that he actually acknowledges it. he doesn't just dismiss it out of hand. But what he doesn't do is understand it. Kefka does not have the ability to comprehend that kind of connection for reasons I'll go into later, and that was just an amazing scene. Now. <sighs> Of course, there were other themes underneath and, and uh, underneath the surface of that one. That is without question the the massive, the primary theme of the game. But there was also, you know, themes of the triumph of effort, the freedom. In fact, actually, it could be argued that every theme from FF one to five was expressed in Final Fantasy VI. Ah. Oh. The freedom versus oppression thing from FF two is very much on display. The light versus dark thing is much more subtle and quiet, but expressed rather intricately <laughs> with the espers and their plight and the difficulties they have, the you know the monsters and all that they have to go through and all that they they, they did go through. You know that's an, and and that's one of those things that's a lot more hinted at than stated outright. But everything we hear about the actual war of the Magi states very strongly that that was very much a, an example of dark versus light, where neither side is evil, just like in FF3. And the themes of FF4, which I don't feel like summarizing again because I already made that massive sentence back in FF4, very much, very much on display. And of course, in a, a, the, the themes from FF5 are also here as well. As I said before, FF6 is the perfect combination of many different things. It is not extreme in anything. It is moderation in everything, with some exceptions, which 
it kind of proves the point if you understand my logic here. Final Fantasy VI did, does not have is is very much an epic game, you know, like four was. It is very large. It is very world, literally world changing through the course of the game. You know, we are talking about heroes. We are talking about warriors. And yet, at the same time, there is a down-to-earth perspective, not just in the NPCs, but in the characters. There are several characters who are there basically to give us that down-to-earth perspective that we are just ordinary people swept up into the circumstances we can't understand. And we see that a lot in named NPCs in just about every town. And my absolute personal favorite example of that is the dying soldier and his, his love, Lola, back in uh, Miranda is where she is. And he is in... Oh, I should know this. I know F6 pretty well, but I'm bad with names with everything, as you know. I can't think of the name of the, the town. Oh, well. I'm retarded. <laughs> I'm going to look it up now, because that's going to really bother me. I'm sorry. I, my OCD is, is like, warg. I'm actually not OCD. I'm, I just have my own little quirks. There we go. Okay. He is in... 14... Mobliz! God, why did I forget that name? Because Mobliz is so important in the world of Ruin. That's probably why I disassociated it. Mobliz, the young soldier who is lying there. He's just a guy. In fact, this is this is another example of something else I'll get into later. But he is simply a down-to-earth, ordinary, normal, you know, not a, uh, not a hero, not a warrior, not someone who can really do anything, but nevertheless tried, nevertheless to, tried to make an impact, tried to change the world in his own tiny, minuscule little way. Uh and unfortunately actually failed. But I think the fact that he failed was a powerful and indeed correct move for the point of the story. Another example of that, now that I'm thinking about it, excuse me, would be uh, the Returners as a whole. Bannon especially is very clearly not a hero. I'm, I, I mean no offense to the man. But you, and I'll talk about Bannon more in, in detail later, but you could tell he is basically someone who is just doing what he can with what he can, which is very little and very little. But let's go ahead and move on here. Who is messaging me? Oh, okay. Um, let's go ahead and switch to these notes now here. Uh, let's talk about the game a bit, rather than the story. I've talked about the story with uh, to a great extent, and I will continue to do so. One of the things they did that was a very good choice, again, moderation. Again, the combination, the hybrid of, of two different styles, of, of more than two different styles. In Final Fantasy IV, and well, okay. Let me let me take this. Let's step back a bit more. In FF1, you had the ability to choose your classes once and roll with that, and it affected what equipment you could use and what spells you could use. In FF2, everyone could master everything, but it didn't actually feel like customization because everyone had to master everything. So. FF3, you had the ability to choose classes, but you could actually switch on the fly. So for the very first time, we had a degree of real customization in the game. FF4, they suddenly took that all away, not counting the remake. In FF4, Cecil was always going to be Cecil. He was always going to have, always going to have his stat progression, always going to have the same equipment, always have the same spells, and so forth and so on with every single other one of the characters, right? In Final Fantasy V, they leapt into the complete opposite end of that and gave you a ridiculous amount of customization, uh, arguably one of the most customizable of the FFs. I say arguable because games like 10 and 12 kind of win by default because you, because everyone was kind of generic. We, we kind of circled back around to the FF2 thing there, didn't we? But moving on. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, I'm just saying. But in FF5, you had a massive amount of customization. There was a lot you could do, and you could do it in any number of combinations with one another or opposing one another, however you want to do it. FF6 decided to take the best of both FF4 and FF5 and use both ideas. What we had here was a game where if you played it without Magisite, which I'll get into in just a moment, you had... Everyone, with the FF4 factor, there were two characters in the whole game who had actual magic. You had a couple characters who had things that could function like magic. You know, Gao and his rages, or Realm and Sketches, and of course, Strago and his lores, for example. But... In every given case, each character had their own thing, their own shtick, whatever it was, and that was their path. The the method the only thing that was unique about all of them or how do I say this properly? They all were linear in terms of their own individual progression 
And so if you just didn't touch Magicite throughout the whole game, and, and Relics for that matter, then what you would have is a fairly FF4-ish game where the, each person progresses in their own manners. Now, on top of that, add into that the Magicite and the Relic system, both of which really deserve to be discussed on their own merits, and all of a sudden you have a massive amount of customizability, even though ultimately the Magicite only alters two things. What stats go up in addition to your normal stats when you level up, and the spells you get. And yet, that was basically the perfect addendum to having the linear progression over here. When, if they had done too much customization on top of that, the linear progression would have been pointless. And if they had remo had too little, well, then it would have point been pointless again for the for the opposing yet ultimately the same reason. It had to be a perfect balance of how much you could alter your characters in relation to what it was they could already do innately. And FF6 hit that balance point, hit that connecting point right there beautifully. And so, yes, you can edit your, your stats to a degree. Yes, you could give them uh, different spells, which, which expanded your repertoire. Yes, you could just level them without, you know. Another thing that is worth noting that in FF6, magic is very much emphasized from a gameplay perspective, you know, because in general the game prefers mages. There are ways, of course, to get around that as far as melees, you know, <laughs> the uh, the fixed die and the offering combo on Setzer comes to mind immediately. But you get the general point, right? That 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 was some, the ma mage users. Everyone knows this. Mage users are generally just the way you go. That's the easy mode of FF6. That's one of the reasons why so many of the challenges involve not using magic. I'll get into challenges in a bit too. But nevertheless, the reason I mentioned this, and and as I was talking about back in FF5, virtually everything in FF6 was done for two reasons. In FF5, everything was done for one reason, to weave it into the narrative, to exp expand the story. In FF6, everything was done for two reasons. To weave it into the story and, and expand upon either the setting, the character, the lore, or whatever, and to make the game funner. FF6 was designed to have flashy, interesting-looking spells that were fun to use and interesting to combine one with, an one with another, including the relic system as well, but th that's a little bit more minor, and of those I'll discuss in a minute. And... This is a setting that went without magic for over for for about a thousand years without magic with only a very very few number of exceptions the the blue mages of of excuse me of the massa are the only really exception here and and some monsters who still have their innate ability you know that's it the espers were in another world and magic was sealed off because the statues were also in the other world and magicite didn't exist nobody had no, no idea what that was and it isn't until the game, just before the game starts, that magic starts to get reintroduced. Magic, which, as I've heard before, is one of the other themes of the game, and, and I actually agree with that, is such an important part to the plot, to the setting, to the story, and to the characters, that having magic be so important in a gameplay perspective fits perfectly, if you understand what I mean. And, it, and it re it, again, it fits those two requirements. It fits those two reasons why they do anything so beautifully. Why is magic so important? Because it makes sense in the story and the plot and the characters and the setting. And because it makes the game funner. Now, uh, I just covered two things I want to discuss a little bit as an aside. Let's go and talk about challenges first. Let's get that out of the way. FF6 w wasn't the first game to actually r start the challenges. In fact, it is debatable which game really started that. But Final Fantasy VI was the first game that I saw that the the boards and the news groups and the all that fun stuff really started to get together. You know, the online community really started to form around FF6, and it, it, from my perspective at least. And that was when people started throwing together, you know, ideas for, for these challenges. Now, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, a challenge is when you look at a game. The Final Fantasy series has many of these, obviously, but it's usually an RPG. And you look at this RPG and you say, okay, let's artificially restrict ourselves in how we're going to play this RPG in order to make it funner. It is, as the name is implied to, as the name is intended to imply, a challenge. It is something you do by choice, completely by by your own uh, volition, in order to make the game more interesting, in order to, to challenge yourself, to have fun with it. And as I've said before, I do enjoy challenge. I do enjoy hard bosses. I do enjoy really working at the really difficult fights, you know, and stuff like that. I don't enjoy artificial difficulty, but I don't think anybody does. But you get the point across, right? So... The reason this is so relevant to why FF6 is a good game is because FF6 was the first, well, well the second FF, but we've already talked about the problems FF5 had as far as being accessible to, to the gaming audience. 
FF6 was effectively the first game that really had the option of doing challenges, because the only challenge you could really do in FF4 was either not use your magic, or not use certain equipment, or not level very much, and that's basically it when it comes down to it, you know. And that's not very fun, that's just kind of like, eh, there's nothing there, if, if it makes any sense. In FF6, by contrast, because they had that linear level leveling system, the linear progression, and the customization, you had the option of abandoning the customization, of never actually using it, of never touching Magicite. And that was awesome. And that's that was the first challenge I heard of, you know, the no Magicite run, which was a lot of fun. And so, and then people started talking about the SCCs, the single character challenge, which was also only really possible in FF6 because FF6 is the first FF to allow you to swap out parties, uh, party swapping. I'll mention that again later. But the availability to party swap and the cost, the customization options both basically had built into the game ways to artificially limit yourself in order to in increase the challenge and have fun with it. I love doing SCCs of FF6. I still do them semi-regularly. I haven't done every character's yet, um, but I've done all the main ones, obviously, and a few side ones that are fun. My personal favorite to date is actually Cyan, because... The, the the way I do SCCs is you can't use any Magicide at all, ever. You can't even put them on to level up your stats. You can't uh, basically equip... Uh, you can't equip the Marvel Shoes. That's important. I think... No, it's not the Marvel Shoes. It's the... The, 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 the Merit... Merit Award. That's it. You cannot equip the Merit Award, which allows you to equip any items is the point. And you can't over-level, basically. You know, you can't just beat the game by leveling too much. No, that, that's just boring. With those three restrictions in mind, certain characters become a lot more interesting, and Cyan is one of them, because Cyan's shtick is he has sword tech, which is really, really fun and useful and helpful when you've got three other party members there. When he's suddenly the only one in the party, what sword tech turns out... Let me let me, let me me demonstrate this first. For those of you who don't know, sword tech, you build up a bar, and then when it gets to the point you want it at, because there's a 1 through 8 here, when it gets to the number you want, you hit go, and it's like, what attack, right? Normally, while this is going, your party members are en enabling their actions that you just told them, and the, the enemies maybe do, and then you click it, and he goes. When you're the only party member, imagine I'm Cyan here. I know this is going to look kind of weird, but you know, this kind of opens, and the enemy attacks me, 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 because all of a sudden, the ATB is picking their turns over and over, because there's nothing interfering, there's nothing pushing them back in the cycle, and I'm just getting mauled while I finally get up here to four, which is usually the one I'd use, and then, okay, finally four. So sword tech is more or less out, which means you have to be very clever with your, your equipment strategy, and it's very difficult, especially since you can't over-level. It is very challenging Oh, and also, by the way, Cyan has extremely low speed, which means everything that it sounds like. Love that side. So anyways, FF6 was the first FF to really... Well, the second FF, like I said, 5. But the first FF that really started that trend. Obviously, FF7 and FF10 both are much more popular for it, for, for good reason, because so, mon so many more audience members came in on, then, uh, on those two games, and... The idea of the challenge already existed. All they had to do was expand upon it, and both FF7 and FF10 were more customizable, and therefore you had more options for limiting yourself. Not saying it's any bad thing, I'm just commenting here. But one of the other things I want to talk about in regard to the customization of the game and, and the way you can uh, level your characters is relics. Relics was an amazing idea. Relics is, is almost hard to explain looking back at it. You know, you have your equipment, you have your, your head slot, your your armor slot, you have a main hand and an off hand. Actually, I think that was it in FF6. And then you have your relic slots. And I should say slots, because there are two. You can equip two relics at a time. Sorry about that. Um, two relics at a time. And these relics can do a lot of things. I don't know how to properly express this. I, I really don't. FF6 kind of started this trend as far as RPGs and video games in general go with the relic slot. But what a relic lets you do is virtually anything from a developer's perspective, I should say. Because the relic slot was not tied to stats. It was not tied to a specific system. It was, I want to edit anything in the game and can do so from here. There is a relic... Excuse me. There is a relic that a light enables you to heal some HP every step you take. There is a relic to make it so that enemies cannot pincer attack you. There is a relic to ensure that you never encounter enemies at all. 
I'm just talking about overworld stuff, though. You're right. There is a relic that changes the, f gets rid of the fight thing in your in your command bar. Get rid of the fight, and then replace it with jump. You know, from the dragoons. And uh, I'm sorry, I keep getting interrupted here. You know, there are relics that do things like make it so that when you you have you can equip a weapon in both hands, so you can actually dual wield. There are relics that enable you to uh, have a higher HP. You know, you uh, you name it basically. As you see, what I'm going with here, that was such a brilliant move because it enabled them to do so much in combat, out of combat. No matter how you look at it, relics were an amazing concept, amazing idea, and would be expanded upon, obviously. In fact, relics were the prototype. Uh, many people think Magicite was the prototype for Materia, but relics were actually the prototype for Materia from a, from a development perspective. And, and with good reason. It, gives, it is such a magnificent tool to the, to, the, to the creators, to the developers of the game. It's one of the reasons I use something very akin to relics or Materia, or whatever you want to call it, in most of my D&D campaigns, because it enables me to, out, to, to allow and to add so many different abilities or concepts or effects or stats to, to the players to give them more variety, to make it more fun. And again, make it more fun and flesh out the story because the relics were something that were actually mentioned and re respected within the 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 story M most of them were actually capable of uh, relics were something that were in lore not out of lore if you know what i mean and what i mean by that is too too often you have gameplay and story segregation right where the game the the npcs and the story are not affected by things like a phoenix down or the fact that you can attack or 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 use magic or whatever right in FF6 and FF5, both, they were very much integrated. You know, I mentioned earlier when talking about Galuf's uh, death scene that they actually used Phoenix Downs and, and, and cures on him and whatnot. And indeed, to use another example here, Gambits, a system that exists in order to help you give uh, AI party orders, basically, in Final Fantasy XII, were something that existed in lore as well. So relics in FF6 did in fact exist in lore, did actually were, were something functional that the world had, had lived with and invented and grown with. And obviously, I shouldn't even have to mention the, the gameplay innovation and the reason why that made the game funner. So again, both reasons here. Now, uh, those are the two points I wanted to cover there, but I, I very much felt like mentioning that. I, I know this this has all actually been a single bullet point on my thing here that I've, ever since I started the customization thing. But it is worth noting because an RPG gameplay is 90%, maybe 80%, but a very large, vast proportion of the gameplay of an RPG is how you do the system. How do you level? How do you customize? What can you do? And so FF6... I think, did it very, very well. Now, uh, let, let's go ahead and look at the next thing here. Uh, okay, the graphics. Now, I've said before, the FF6 is arguably one of the nicest looking games on the entirety of the SNES. There are some com competitors, of course, in different genres, but while FF6 still did have the super deformed thing and still had the sprites, they did a lot of additional things in order to make it look a lot better. First of all, the backgrounds were gorgeous. You can tell someone spent a long time crafting those backgrounds. They actually looked better than drawn in many cases, if you know what I'm saying here. They looked gorgeous. They looked amazing. My favorite to date is still the uh, background for the mountains. In any mountain area, you, you see it in the backgrounds. It's just kind of this misty mountains thing, you know? I, I don't even know what else to call it. it. It looks gorgeous. It looks amazing. And of course, the same was true in the battle sequences. You know, a battle fi fires up, and you see, yes, there's this section here that's obviously where the characters and the enemies should be, and then you see this absolutely intricately detailed background in the back now, in the back there. And this also extended to the characters as well. And one of the things they did very right, and most artists will tell you this, especially in a video game setting, one of the ways to make your game or art or whatever it is you're doing look more cartoony, look more fake, is to actually do outlines. Anyone who is anyone who is a decent art teacher will tell you real life doesn't actually have outlines for most for the most part. Um, you know, let me give you an example directly here. Okay, yeah, let me pull up the camera view so I can actually see myself here. Okay, this if someone was drawing this quick trip, quick trip cup, most people would do so, and, and rather correctly, by first outlining it. Get the, this thing going, and then they'd maybe add this, add a couple of shading lines here, 
drawing this, and there you go, there's the cup, right? But it would still look fake, and the reason why would be because you did this outline and took a drink from it. Now, there's a, a technique, and I unfortunately do not remember the name anymore. I, I took quite a few art classes back in school. Uh, of course, I took a lot of everything classes back in school. That basically involves not drawing lines, is what it comes down to. Rather than making this edge by doing a single line here, for example, let's actually rotate this a little bit. Let's really get the point across. There we go. Rather than doing this line with, uh, or this edge with a line, what you could do is this shading that that is making this a slightly different shade than the background there, even though it's the same kind of gray. Let's say you're doing it with just pencil and a little bit of a uh, paper spreader, right? You could do that right up to the edge here, and then kind of taper it off, and then leave it like that. And so rather than having an outline, rather than having a defined border, it just does this thing. And th that tends to look a lot more realistic. So what I'm getting to here is Final Fantasy VI did that a lot. Final Fantasy VI had a lot of areas and a lot of sequences where there were no outlines, where there were no boundaries, to, especially to the characters, where it was actually something you... It, it was just skin up to here rather than skin line, you know? And it worked amazingly. Now, yes, there were some lines there, and, and I'm not talking in 100% fashion, but it was something they used as an artistic technique in order to make the game look f so much better, so much more artistic, actually, is the word I want to use. So much... And I mean genuinely artistic, not Mass Effect 3 artistic. Um, and it worked really well. It really helped flesh the game out. It really helped... Uh, stretch the limits of the SNES and make that game look absolutely gorgeous. It is still one of my favorite looking games of, of, the, of the 2D variety and there's a good reason for that. A lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of everything was put into that game. My goodness. Now, uh, let's see. What, let's go ahead and... Uh, what do we got? That's a story thing. Let's not talk about another story thing. That's another story thing. What else have we got here? That's not story related. Story, 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 story. No, I'm kidding. Um, okay. One of the other things I mentioned earlier, and I've mentioned since, that FF6 ha was, it was, a, it was a blend, was a hybrid between the new and the old. It was actually also literally a hybrid in terms of the, the, the setting, in terms of the way the game works, because FF6 was the first time, well actually the second time, because FF5 did this first, but FF6 was the first time in popularity where they blended magic, a magical setting, a high fantasy setting, with technology. Now I say this is the second because Final Fan you know, airships technically could count, depending on how you define it. I don't think they do, because I had to use the word technically, and therefore it's wrong. But even ignoring that concept, FF5 did have the Linkia or whatever ruins, which were very clearly pure technology, and that was in a fantasy setting. But I don't think that actually counts, and the reason why was because that was technology in a fantasy setting. FF6 was the first time that technology and magic actually merged, and this is something that they would continue as a trend for virtually every FF since then, FF7 being the most po pr uh, pro prominent example that I could think of, although FF8 did as well, of course, but FF7, you know, Mako and the live stream and all that were very intricately uh, tied into technology. It was actually fuel, for goodness sakes. So, point being, you know, the term Magitech exists for a reason. It exists because FF6 invented it. It exists because that is when we first started seeing that as a, as a narrative tool. And, of course, as usual, it was used to enhance gameplay as well. Not only, of course, did we have really awesome-looking scenes and areas, but we got to actually pilot Magitek armor more than once. Uh, three times total, I believe, actually. And each time, it was basically meant to be uh, what I would refer to as a vehicle section in WoW terms. In other words, okay, you've had the quest and you've been doing your normal thing. Let's give you a vehicle which has a completely different set of abilities. All of them are extremely powerful, and the whole point is, go nuts, have fun. And that's what the Magitek armors were there for, as far as a gameplay perspective, as far as making the game more fun. Again, hitting those two points. You could actually just go and go ballistic and just, yep, yep, Thunderbeam, Tech Missile, and just blow through things without even trying. And it was fun. It was a lot of fun. And as usual, of course, it, it I just shouldn't even have to tell you how that, that wove into the narrative, how that it, it expanded the story of the game. So there's that as well. And of course, finally, is the fact that they were using technology to affect magic. This is another thing they did new. They, the, I mean, the the actual augmentations, the the imbuing that they were doing before they discovered Magicite was literally using technology, using machines to drain magic and magical essence from living beings who were living magical beings and and infuse them into other people. And if that's not a blend of magic and technology in the truest sense of the word, I don't know what is. Um, so 
this was also an interesting thing because it really spoke to the changing eras of of real life of, of the, the audience uh, you know the classic epic adventure of of fantasy proportions will always have a certain place in our hearts let's be honest with ourselves however all of the ffs to date had been that they wanted to try something new and ff6 had a very uh, an almost steampunk feel to it at times while it was still very much an epic while still very much a high fantasy there was a sufficient enough of 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 industry for lack of a better term you know they, they were basically at the point of which the uh, of the second Re- uh, industrial revolution in real life terms you know they had steam power they had trains they had boats that that did not require the wind in order to function you know and they had bizarre technology that was of an old variety that nonetheless was more advanced than several things we have now again the steampunk variety thing you know magic armor comes to mind of course immediately but of course the guardian back in uh, vector is a great example of what i'm talking about and so it was a very effective way of trying to reach out and do different things and do new things they would keep going in that direction for the next several Final Fantasies until they did kind of a whiplash thing in FF9 and then got back to the fantasy uh, sort of thing in FF10. Whether or not that's a good thing or not is, of course, up to the individual. But it's in my opinion that the very first time they did this, when they were still at the peak point, when they are still at the, the crossover road here, here in FF6, was extremely well done and was a good move, a good decision. And it is also worth noting that, as usual, it, it managed to endear itself to both audiences because it was a high fantasy classic epic you know down to earth everything story that also had a lot of almost science fiction elements to it and and the the steampunk element the the science element to it so next thing I'm going to talk about let's see here is the endings and I say endings plural for good reason there are actually only two endings to FF6 and I don't mean different endings I mean there are two endings to FF6 they really should be qualified in their own rights Final Fantasy, I've said before, FF4 has my favorite ending of the various FFs. That's still true. That's very much true. What FF6 did was interesting. FF6, I don't even know how to describe it at this point in time. I want you to imagine you're playing your SNES. And I I would imagine anyone watching this video knows what the SNES looks like as far as graphic potential, okay? And you've just beaten the game, and the game kind of fades to black right at the weirdest point. Basically, the entire last dungeon is shuddering and about to collapse and everyone's fleeing for their lives and then it fades to black and a very peaceful song starts to play and I'm sure there was just a little bit of confusion there this certainly was for me and then you see a book come into animation on the ground and now granted even look, looking back at this it's a little bit amusing to me but at the time when that book started turning the pages the sheer level of quality and the animation and the graphics literally blew me away I was actually jaw dropped by that scene, by by seeing that this was a brand new level of tech that they added to this game, to only be seen during one scene, during the ending. They did it purely for this. They didn't do it for anything else. This was something they did to make the ending better, and it was mind boggling. And they kept doing it: the spinning coin, the apple with the the the, the shurikens in it, the the little toy house that had the moogles on it you know every little part of it had some level of detail and animation and amazingness to it that actually made it look for lack of a better term real it looked incredible and the way the credits rolled or the first ending rolled the first ending if on its own merits is is a, is a thing of wonder a thing of beauty to me you see little snippets of every single character that you brought with you towards the ending it does vary based on who you bring with you. If you don't bring someone, then you just see this little extra cutscene of their face implanted over a, a location where they were or should be as if they were dead, in, like in, for example, Shadow's case. But if you do it properly and bring all the characters, you see a scene for every single character. You see a scene detailing them and their escape. And it, and despite the fact that they're escaping from their death, this whole ending is extremely lighthearted. It is very much a triumph. It is very, you know, the music is very soft, but also is, is a medley. It is a medley of every single theme of every single character in the game uh, flowing together in a way I can only call beautiful. And... As you're watching it, as as you're as you're viewing this, and as everyone's trying to escape, and you you learn more about them, and they learn more about each other, and the relief is palpable, not just for the player but for the characters, and 
I don't even know what else to say about it. It was amazing. It was even done in black and white, which which may look may make you go, huh? But no, seriously, it was an artistic movement. It was a, a design intent to say, rather than just have this be another ending and series of cutscenes, let's do something with this. And as it's going by, what will happen is it'll be like, you know, this thing comes along and it says, Cyan, in my case, for example, and the name will play, uh, or no, Cyan Garamondi, his full name, as played by... Cyan, whatever it, and whatever it is, the second name is whatever you named them. And and speaking as someone who renames my characters fairly often in an FF, it was absolutely incredibly awesome to see, you know, various characters. I'm not going to give you any of the names, but you know, uh, let, let's just pull one that everyone knows: Zedenra. Um, Zedenra, you know, Celis Share as played by Zedenra, and I was just like, yes! There was something so cool about that 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 both brought you in and pushed you out of the story more or less at the same time. It was a brilliant move. And then, of course, we reach the second ending, which is much longer. Our, uh, I don't, it's not the longest FF ending ever, but my goodness, it is a very long one, especially given that this is a SNES game, I want to stress again. And it has virtually no dialogue. It has, like, four lines in the entire thing. And it it's hard to explain, because on the one hand, it almost feels uh, empty, but on the other hand, it feels refreshing. It FF6 is one of an extremely small number of games that I will actually play to the end, beat the last boss, and watch the ending on replays. Usually when I replay a, a game, especially an RPG, I, there is a certain point at which I will simply stop. It's not because I don't enjoy it. or Well, okay. It's because usually the last boss isn't really worth my time, or isn't interesting enough to play. This is not always the case, by the way. This is just the, the commonality. And... I don't really feel like seeing the ending again because I've already seen the ending and it's not that worth watching again. There are exceptions to this. Like I said, FF6 is a very strong exception to that. Every time I replay it, I do, you know, go through the entire endings. I do fight Kefka. I do go through both endings. And I do sit there and watch as the airship sails across the world and you see virtually every single town as you pass by, as they rebuild the houses and as the children play in the streets and as the birds fly in the sky. And as event upon event upon event happen, and you see a world... How do I put this? The entirety of the world of Ruin, I'll discuss this more in detail later, is... is is uh, What happens is you go from an absolute high in the terms of the story... I, I'm kind of getting into this initially, but let's just summarize. The world of Ruin starts in a pit, and it barely pulls itself up to be what can almost be called desperate hope, okay? It's, it's not, you know, ah, everything's gonna be great, it's we're not going to give up. You know, it's not quite defiance, but it is very much a desperate, you know, oh my gosh, this is our last chance, but we are going to try our best hope that keeps you going throughout the world of ruin. And a very strong theme, a very strong message that is coming across a lot in the world of ruin is that the the world might already be past saving. And I don't mean... I, I've mentioned before that the, wor the, the question should be asked in many RPGs, in many video games, is this world worth saving? Is this setting worth saving? You know, And that's a question that's usually asked uh, rather pertinently in, for example, Western RPGs. In FF6, the question is, can this world be saved? Even if we stop Kafka, even if we put magic back together, is this world already too defeated, too bloodied, too injured in order to recoup? And this is all relevant because after having an entire half of the game of that being beaten into our heads, what we see during that final ending is a world that is taking its first breath, the first breath it has had in a year, and showing that it is not ready to die yet, that it is going to keep going, and there is a triumph in that that I don't even know how to express in words. I really don't. And that is why I sit and watch that ending every damn time, because it's that triumph, that, is su that, that success, that overcoming of, of everything is, is beyond words and, and incredible and amazing and emotional and oh my goodness I'm actually tearing up just a little bit thinking about it not that I apologize for that but my goodness so let, let's go ahead and talk about the story some more I know I've talked about the story already what do we got here what else we got here um, that's a character thing that's a character thing this is a narrative thing we could talk about a narrative thing we just talked about the ending that might be a good segue what do you think? Okay. 
<laughs> I wonder how many people in the audience just said, yes, do it. Um, one of the things FF6 did throughout its narrative is a lot of what I call psych-outs. They were actually done rather well, on all things considered. My, my favorite to this day is the trip to Vector. Now, it's also worth noting that FF6 is an absolutely gargantuan game. Oh, excuse me. And it is not outside of feasibility. Because by the time we are going to Vector, there's only one continent we haven't actually explored yet. There's only one part of the map we haven't seen. Usually when they when a game tries to do this kind of thing, it's obvious that that's not happening because either you're on disc one, or because, you know, in, in the more recent eras, or because, you know, there's parts of the map you haven't been to. In FF6, there were, like, there were two islands we hadn't been to, and of course, the last continent where the Empire was. And that was it. And the two islands weren't really prevalent in our minds, so all we see is the last island, which we are going to now. And they had this whole additional segment of you going on the airship towards Vector, and Vector looming in the background, and the music playing. And there was a very strong feeling of, this is it. This is the last dungeon. This is the last boss that we are going towards. And it's also worth noting, FF6 was a long game, so we haven't exactly been playing for like 10 hours at this point. We're, we're quite a ways into it, at least if you're playing like I do. So it was fully reasonable to think that this was it. And when you get in there and start going through Vector itself and start going through the Magitech Research Facility, which, uh, put simply, the Magitech Research Facility would function as a last dungeon. In fact, technically did, ironically enough. I don't know if that was intentional or not, but that's still amusing to think about. But, you know, it felt very much like a last dungeon. It, it very much had that feel of, of you know... All right, let's do it. This is it. And you even got to see Kefka being, you know, his usual evil self, even though we were sort of assuming at the time still that Geshtal would be the last boss. And as we go through there, because I'll get into that later, as we go through there, we finally get to the point where we have an epic confrontation, and Kefka shows up, and Celis has this big thing, and Sid is there, and it's it's right about the moment we have the little escape scene that we realize this isn't actually the last dungeon, because we wouldn't be escaping then if it was true. But all the way up until that moment, up until that scene where all the espers were gathered there, it had all the makings from a, from a narrative perspective and from a game perspective to be the last boss in that room. And it was very well done. It was very well constructed. Most people, of course, don't think about that anymore because, you know, we, we all know FF6. We all have played it, and we know that there was a world of balance, there was a world of ruin, blah, blah, blah. But looking at it from a completely new and fresh perspective, or looking at it while really thinking about it, really going into depth to it, like happened back in FF4, you know, the more you think about it, the more you tend to enjoy it, the more you tend to reveal. And this is another example of that. Uh, again, as with FF4, I'm going to try very hard not to to talk about the many, 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 many examples of, of where you could look into it more and... and understand it more and, and get more out of it, but this is one of those I just wanted to mention. There's a second one, which is also, again, a psych-out. At this point in time, we actually have explored the entire planet. We have gone and... Excuse me. We have gone and... How do I put this? We've made peace with the Empire. Kefka's behind bars. We have gone to the last the last island, the, the very last part of the, the map that we haven't been to at this point, or we... Might have gone to, but you know what I mean. The, the last time the plot has gone there, we've discovered the ancient mage people, we've discovered the espers that have gone pe berserk, General Leo is on our side finally, like he was always supposed to be, you know, and we've made peace with the espers and we've got the thing, and there's even a scene, this is actually really funny, there's even a scene that looks like this is going to be the actual happy ending, where, and, and it's worth noting, this is the highest point of the entire game, actually, not counting the ending. This is the moment where everything is going its best, or at least it appears to be. And there's an off there's an offhand joke that Realm gives and that Strago res responds to, and Locke actually waves at the camera, and then you hear Kefka's laugh, and then it all goes to hell very quickly, and it doesn't recover till the end of the game, it just plummets. And from that moment on, I'll talk again. I'll talk about that more when I get to pacing. But that was another one of those psychos. That was another one of those moments of you know maybe we're approaching the end here. And nope, nope, sorry. And I actually liked that. I liked that about FF6 because it can. It not only did it kind of keep you guessing, but it's it's more interesting looking back upon it as a story, more so than it is look more so than we look back at it as a game. And it adds a little bit of flavor to it, in my opinion. You know, it really adds to the to the 
structure of the story and, and the way that, that, that everything progressed. Now, let's go ahead and c continue talking about narrative here for a moment. Let's talk about something I've hinted at three times so far during this review, the, the narrative as a whole. F Final Fantasy VI had perfect pace, in my opinion. You start off kind of almost in a, a null, a lull, I'm sorry. And it's done that way for a reason, because the, the only person who is actually a party member at that point is under a, a severe mind control, which gives her a severe amnesia at the, moment, at, the, at the moment. And so you start off just kind of drifting in a doldrum, you know, out on the seas. And then all of a sudden, things just kind of stop. And what happens then is the game paces itself very deliberately, and it very, very slowly starts to accelerate. You start to learn about the Empire... Okay, you start to learn about you, the very first time you meet Kefka, and Kefka from the very beginning looked very much like he was going to be the front villain, like Golbez was back in FF4, and like Zand was back in FF3. You know, it, it that that did appear to be very much how things were going to go, which is ironic when you think about it. So we met our front villain, and we're still escalating. We're actually still going quite slowly. We have been introduced to the plot, but we still have to go through a whole section before we even continue that particular element because of the way the characters are limited. Again, pacing, and it, was, it just kind of kept going. It never actually stopped. It had the FF5 thing. There was no breaks. There were no jarring segments. It was all flowing and all flowed beautifully and moved together. And then we get to this part, and I'm going to skip ahead a lot here. It, it got to the point where we started doing this thing right about when we when we went to Vector for the first time, and we got the first airship, and we started finding out what our next plan was, and we went to the Esper Cave, blah, 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 blah. And if you were to look at the game uh, in, in terms of tone, in terms of, of, of escalation, both in terms of energy and, and feeling emotion in it, it very much does this, and it scales pretty linearly all the way up until we hit the, the floating continent, which I guess, by the way, it's also worth noting the floating continent was another one of those psych outs I mentioned. The floating continent was very much a last dungeon. It was it, it screamed last dungeon. It, the monsters there are harder than, arguably, the hardest monsters in the game because of, of your relative level at the time. And there were actually many bosses. There were tons of bonus little chests. There was actual puzzle things. And at the end of it was both Gestal and Kefkal and the freaking magi. magi. Of it, everything about that was like yes, last dungeon. Yes, last boss. And then. And here's the here's the the crucial point. Here's the critical point. Then the world was destroyed. A game that had been doing this in terms of plot, in terms of pacing, in terms of everything had sped up and sped up and sped up and sped up and gotten higher and gotten faster and gotten more impacting. And then you finally have this epic, awesome, amazing scene of incredibleness right there on the floating continent. And and then it plummets straight down. And what follows is what I like to refer to as a whisper. If you could picture this as an, in an audio format, this is like an orchestra. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, an orchestra of people, a, a vocal. I, I guess suddenly can't think of the term of that. Uh, a choir? There we go. A choir, which has been singing and singing and singing, and they get louder, and they get louder, and they get louder, and then they all go dead quiet and start whispering as quietly as they can, and they stay whispering for a while. The sheer contrast of it was beautiful. The whole end of the world thing with Celis on the island and that whole section was beautifully paced and was designed to be a not just a break but a pause a, a whisper and that whole sequence just was like the tiny if we're talking about an actual orchestra with instruments now imagine a single violin who is playing a single quiet sad note after this massive, you know, after da 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 and then it all goes quiet, and all you can hear is this violin doing this one quiet note in the background. This is what that scene was, and this is what I'm talking about. The pacing of FF6 was was tear-inducing tear because of how incredible it was. You hear this one note, and then it starts to build, and then it starts to build, and then you hear another note join it in as Sabin joins the pony. We hear a third note as Terra is found. We hear a fourth note as we encounter Edgar. And this just kind of keeps building and building and building as we go until finally we get the Falcon. And up until this was another this is another example of the game done doing it for game purposes and doing it for story purposes. Up until we got the Falcon, an extremely depressing grim, grievous, saddened song plays for the overworld of the world of ruin, and everything is rotting, and everything is, is going away, and with one exception, which is South Figaro, 
Everything looks terrible. Everything looks bad. Terra has lost the will to fight. Several of the towns are worried about, you know, losing vegetation. Several of the towns are in ash. You know, everything is horrible. Everything is terrible. And then we get the Falcon, and that song, that glorious song starts to play. Searching for Friends is the name of it. I strongly recommend you go look it up. If, if just, just to listen to it, just YouTube, Final Fantasy VI, Searching for Friends. Oh my goodness. And that just starts firing up. And it never stops, if that makes any sense. That is the overworld music from that point on. Which was done specifically to get the point across, both from a game perspective and a story perspective, that we are now at the hope spot. And from that point off, after this plummet into this cliff, and after we've finally gotten that, we finally have a chance. We finally have a hope, a prayer of a hope, at, final, at, at maybe trying to save what is left of our world and our people. And you spend the rest of that game, hopefully, doing everything and getting everyone. And that escalation happens again as you, as Cyan and fights his demons literally, and and enc- encounters all the the ill that he finds in himself. And we find out what Strago, what had been holding Strago back from his youth and all these long years. And we learn that, yeah, you know, so much. We learn so much. I'm sorry. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna go into details, but. We learn about the characters, we grow with the characters, we, we enhance, we move, everything just uplifts and uplifts, and finally we all turn as one, united, towards the Kefka's Towers and say, no, we are not going quietly into this good night. We are going to fight for our right to, not just to survive, but to live. And, ah, yes, my God. So, <laughs> it really was... It really was amazing. The, the the whisper that became a roar that is Final Fantasy VI, and the pacing was brilliant. The pacing was perfect. Now, let's let's go ahead and move on here before I gush anymore. What else have we got here? A um, couple other game things I want to mention here. One of the innovations they did, again, they had party swapping. I, wonder, I, I said I was going to mention this earlier. Party swapping was a new invention to the Final Fantasy series. They had never actually done that as an option before. It became somewhat normal from this point on, which is funny to look back on it to think FF6, you know, that far into the series is the first time they actually enabled us to switch out party members more or less at will. Um, the availability of it, of course, depended on the point in the story for both gameplay and for story reasons, but the the options it enabled were significant, to say the least, including customization and the availability of seeing different sides of the story, which is the real point I wanted to get to here. This is interesting both from a coding perspective and from a story perspective. Many times when I replay FF6, uh, replay it I should say at this point, I would take different party members with me for different sequences. The reason why is because they would say different things. This, again, like I said, this is interesting from a coding perspective because they had to do what is effectively a callback. I'm not going to get into details. They had to make it so that when a certain scene is playing and party members are saying something, they had to have a bit of dialogue for every party member that could be there for that sequence. And so if you brought Edgar and Sabin, they would say, you know, A and B. That's not what they'd actually be at the point. And then if you brought Edgar and Cyan, they would say A and C. And if you brought Cyan and Gao, they'd say C and Go, And, you know, so forth and so on, right? And not only was that a brilliant thing to do and a very difficult thing to do, especially doing it brand new. You know, again, now it's kind of the norm, but it was a brand new concept, a brand new idea back then. So that was a difficulty they had to overcome from a coding, from an engineering perspective. But it also added a very interesting incentive to people like me who actually savor and indeed craved, basically, the little extra snippets. I would replay FF6 purely because I wanted to see what Edgar would say, would see. Say, no, say is correct. We'll see what Edgar would say as I went through the game, or, or Sab, or Cyan, or, or, or Locke, or whomever, you know. I wanted to see the different dialogue tidbits. They weren't huge, they just fleshed out the characters and fleshed out the setting, just in tiny little increments, but it was worth it enough that I wanted to replay those segments just to see that. And I know I'm not alone in that. Now, Oh, my. Uh, speaking of, of little s- snippets and little sequences, I mentioned uh, quite a while ago that there was a lot of optional things that really fleshed out the game, and I'm not, I wasn't even talking about the World of Ruin stuff. There's a story I'd like to, to share with you, if you don't mind. My fifth, I believe, time playing through FF6. There's, there's a sequence in the game where you've just... Uh, the airship has crashed, you've just finished the Esper Cave mission, and the airship has crashed, and you go to Vector, and you talk with the Emperor, you do the banquet, you do the mini game, you get all the awesome rewards of the mini game, because of course you do the mini game perfectly. And uh, 
what ends up happening is you are supposed to go down to uh, Gidor, I believe, or Nikea. I can't remember which. I think it's Nikea. And get in the, get in the Imperial ship and continue the plot, right? Well, one of the things you can do is go and check out the other towns and, and just talk to people. There's not much to see there. But you can also go back to the airship. Now, I really want to get this point across, okay? Vector, uh, I'm sorry, the continent, the southern continent, is pretty darn large. And you don't actually have access to a chocobo. Well, actually, I think you do have access to a chocobo. I didn't know this at the time, so I'm an idiot. But let's ignore the chocobo aspect for a second. You have to cross this entire continent from way over here, all the way over here. These, these fights aren't particularly difficult. They're just long. Go all the way over here to the nearest town, which is the nearest point of interest, then somehow know to keep going, and then you see the airship and you go in, and what is your reward for doing all of this? Is it loot? Is it a new piece of magicite? Because, you know, we, we've introduced magicite at this point. Is it anything like a relic? No. Your reward for going into this is an absolutely incredible cutscene with Setzer, which fleshes out his character arguably more than almost any other cutscene in the game. The only other exception would be when you get the Falcon. That cutscene spoke so much to him and his character and how he was, and it did so so simply and so quickly and so effectively that it blew me away that I can't believe I've never seen that before. To this day, when I replay FF6, I go and make that long trip to the other end of the continent just so I can see that one scene. That's FF6 right there in a nutshell. The fact that it was not only you know story and dialogue that I, that I endeavored, that I worked to get, but the fact that it was worth it. Now, of course, nowadays I know you can go and just get the... Uh, the chocobo that's right next to uh, Zen, I believe, and then ride that down there, and then take the chocobo from Miranda and ride that back. But whatever, it was still worth it even before I knew about that. And my goodness, bravo and props there. One of the other things I want to talk about, no, let's go ahead and start segueing into characterization here, shall we? Let's talk about several of the NPCs and the major ones and, and their roles and their, their perspective. We've got Sid, right? Sid, of course, was not new the 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 Sid having a Sid was it was certainly not new. It's been it had been around since FF two, and this particular Sid was, however, the first Sid who was actually working for the enemy. It's another trend that would that would start and kind of continue for a while. But this Sid was still very much a good guy. He was just incredibly naive. The way they portrayed him was almost interesting because this Sid in FF four the Sid who built the airships and and learned everything from Kluya. Excuse me. Oh my. I did so not just for the sake of technology itself, but for the betterment of his kingdom. It was then, after that, after this technology existed, after he had turned over all of this stuff to the kingdom, that Baron became taken over by Kenazo, and we, or Kagnazo, depending on which version you're playing, and we had the problem with Baron misusing it as a weapon. In this section, Sid is very directly imbuing these soldiers of an empire so that the military can go conquer the world and he knows this and he's culpable in this but he is very much he's got very much the Otacon thing for you Metal Gear Solid fans you know he was extremely naive very much science for science sake but ultimately we get the very strong impression as we see his character arc go throughout the game that Sid was in a very intentional denial that he claimed science for science sake that he was championing that cause but he was doing so because it was an excuse because he knew it was an excuse because in truth he knew what he was doing was wrong but what he wanted was to engage in this science because it was his passion, his love, it was what he cared about, was, was learning and growing and, and discovering, you know, he invented Magitech. The Magitech research facility was built for and designed by Sid, and he wanted that. It was his desire, and so he felt so immensely guilty that he had to put up this front of science for science sake in order to cover himself over with it. It wasn't until the the in incident at the Magic Research Facility when he finally meets a group of people who are determined to the point of absolution to do something about this problem and to fix the world that he finally was able to stare at himself and all his guilt and all his regrets and finally say okay, what I'm doing is wrong and as much as I want it me wanting it isn't enough anymore and that is a, an amazing amount of characterization to go into a character that's not even a player character Geshtal. We learn a lot about Geshtal uh, through the books and the supplements, unfortunately, but we have a lot of hints within the game itself. Geshtal was an extremely rich merchant who discovered ancient texts by sheer accident. 
that talked about an ancient power in terms of the espers and what they could do, and the very concept of magic. And Geshtal represents an evil man, certainly, to be, to be assured, but there's more to it than just being a bad guy. Geshtal is what we call avarice personified, okay? Even that's being too simple about it, but my point is, what Geshtal wanted was more. He he says it all. Everything about Geshtal can be summarized by a single line. Uh, this is a lie. Uh, but everything I'm talking about right now, as far as this person, this particular aspect of his personality, can be summarized by a single line he has on the floating continent just after Kefka has defeated him and is about to fling him to his death. And that line is, There will be no one left to worship us. Geshtal wanted to rule the entire world as a deity, as a god, not as its emperor, not as its ruler, but as one they actually bowed and scraped before. He wanted... there's a term for that, and I, I suppose it would be egomaniacism, but taken to its furthest extreme. That was Geshtal. He wanted more. He wanted to be on the top of the heap. He wanted everyone in the entire world to bow and scrape. He wasn't interested in ruling, like some people are. He wasn't interested in conquering. He wasn't interested in the power itself. He was interested purely in, if I might say so, quite so bluntly, the immediate gratifi gratification in a long-term sense without the, prob the problem of consequence. He wanted to do what he wanted to do, when he wanted to do it, without having to worry about anything else. He was, in other words, a child. He was very childish. He wanted because he wanted, and he didn't want to have to deal with any of the mess of dealing with that. And he had a sufficient enough drive and ambition to build an empire that conquered half the planet in order to make that childish whim come to, pa come to pass, come to fruition. And there is something incredibly poetic about that and interesting about that. Geshtal, especially in the remakes when his dialogue is cleaned up by the new translation, is a rather unforgivable, irredeemable villain. There is no positive side to Geshtal. He is manipulative. He is utterly willing to do anything. He has no limits. He has no lines. You know, most villains, even evil villains, will only go to a certain point. Geshtal stopped at nothing, murdered a, a mother and in, in cold blood, stabbed her in the back, literally, in order to steal her baby girl because it would suit his ends. You know, I don't have many other better ways of putting that. Geshtal was an evil bastard, and the closest thing to a complete monster in this game, and I'll, I'll discuss that later when I get to the pertinent point, finally. So let's move on from Geshtal. We then, of course, immediately after Geshtal, and this is relevant, have General Leo. Now, why is it a man as honorable and as disciplined as Leo would follow Geshtal? We only have snippets here. We only have inferences. We can only guess. But it's very clear, to me at least, that what we have in Leo is a young man who was probably, at least in part, raised by Geshtal, grew up with him, at the very least. Because Geshtal is a, is a rather elderly uh, man, and Leo was rather young, all things considered. Uh, so was Celis, for that matter and Terra and a lot of the characters, but you get my point. Geshtal was old, and certainly old enough to have been an adult when Leo was born, and we very much get the impression that Leo had so much loyalty to this man because Geshtal had probably done a great deal for him. And this is part of, again, why Geshtal is such a ridiculously unforgivably evil character because it is very clearly indicated that Geshtal was manipulating Leo from the beginning and I do mean from the beginning, when Leo was a child. He did the same with Celis, after all. But he intentionally raised Leo to be loyal to him, took care of him, um, watched after him, you know, provided for him, was a good father figure, specifically so that when Leo grew up, this young boy would become loyal, would stay loyal, and Geshtal would have his servant. Not because of any actual caring. Not because he gave any any bit of a damn about him, but because it was another way for Geshtal to get his own way. And Leo is such a victim of Geshtal and his depravities. And this is just another... He was basically screwed from the beginning, if I might say so. It took until Kefka was the one who tried to betray and murder Leo that Leo finally was willing to stand against the Empire as a whole. But... I say that specifically because Kefka is a little bit different than, you know, 
excuse me, than, uh, than Geshtal doing it. You know, if Geshtal had been the one to show up and do that, it is actually probable that Geshtal might have been able to talk his way through it, and probably would have, because Geshtal was extremely charismatic, extremely intelligent, and extremely diplomatic. And he probably could have talked Leo into the circumstance. The only reason Leo turned at all was because it was Kefka, who Leo had always despised. And it's also worth noting that despite the fact that Leo hates Kefka, and hated the idea of experimenting on Terra as a child, and hated the idea of the Magitek infusion, he still went along with all of it. That is how strong his loyalty was to Le to Emperor Geshtal. That is how badly he was screwed up in the head by Emperor Geshtal. So it's it's an interesting take on both of their characters to to display that crime there, that 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 tragedy. Um, the last one I want to talk about for for NPCs is Bannon. Bannon uh, very much gives the impression that I mentioned back in FF5, the, the, the down-to-earth thing, the everyman thing. Bannon gives a very clear uh, distinction, impression, of someone who is trying very hard to appear to be the wise ruler, the wise uh, commander, I should say, actually, the wise leader, and knows what he's doing and is is well adjusted and was I don't know how to put this properly. He was trying to be what he believed the returners need in order to uh as as a leader. He was trying to be that ideal. He was trying to be that and failing because he wasn't actually like that, if you follow what I'm saying there. He was he was an everyman. He was just another guy. No power to him, no no particular skills, no nothing. I guess he has heal, but you get my point. He was just a guy. Not that experienced in warfare, not that experienced in the way of people. All he was was another guy who got together a bunch of other normal guys and got together and said, the Empire has to be stopped. Let's do something about it. The only thing that was different about Bannon than any other Joe on the street is Bannon decided to do something about it. Bannon decided to rise up and say no. And that's one of the reasons I like Bannon so much, and it is such a shame that he is, he is killed in, in the, the, the shift over, the, the destruction of the world. He is one of the casualties, because, and, and actually, it is extremely strongly implied that Bannon was actually murdered by the Empire just before that event happened. He is one of, as well as Arvis from Narsh, it is, and, and the, the Narsh Elder. It is extremely strongly implied that their fate is unpleasant because of the betrayal of the Empire. <laughs> one more crime to put on Geshtal's lap here, I guess. And it's such a shame because Bannon provided such a wonderful perspective from an NPC you know, point of view. You know, the, it's, it's literally this guy who is no, nobody, who's just this other Joe comes out of nowhere and rises up and barely manages to scrap together something that can almost be called a resistance. And then heroes, heroes of legend, a, a, a king and a, and a powerful, amazing martial artist and a woman who knows magic literally drop into his lap, basically. Not literally, literally but you know, effectively, literally drop into his lap and basically take the reins of the Returners away from him and start taking over the, the aspect of actually saving the world. And all of a sudden, Bannon, for the first time, finds himself having to actually stay behind the scenes and make up real strategies, because for the first time, they have a chance at accomplishing something. They can actually win this, and now the burden of responsibility is even greater than it was before. Now it's not just, let's do something. Now we have to do this right, because at my word, people live and die now. And there's a lot of weight that sits on the character of Bannon that is demonstrated throughout the game. And uh, it is somewhat, and indeed, actually rather significantly unfortunate, his fate. Because I really liked Bannon. I thought he was an extremely well-done character, and, and I've just kind of outlined why. My lips are actually getting dry. Um, okay. What do we got left here? That, that, that list is done. I'm done with that list. What do we got on here? Already talked about that. Already talked about that. Okay. Three more things, and then we get to the final cut, li uh, cut list. What is a cut list? The final checklist. Uh, and all of these are actually cut the, all of these three points are basically the same points. So I'm just going to start. Final Fantasy VI had no main character. Final Fantasy VI. It has been argued many times that Final Fantasy VI does have a main character. I have heard many discussions about this in many different directions. As you can tell, I am one of the people who believe there is no main character. There is no Cecil. There is no Cloud. There is no Squall. There is just the party and. 
I actually rather like that. I think that was an incredibly brilliant uh, decision to do with a game that is so about people and their relations and their interpersonal. You know, like I said, the theme of FF6 is love and the interactions between people. And so having a game with that strong of a theme, it actually makes perfect sense to not have a main character, to rather have many characters who all have a, a strong stake in the story and the plot and, and the setting and have a very strong reason. Again, there are two exceptions here. I'm only going to mention these briefly right now. Umaro and Gogo kind of sidestep everything I'm talking about the characters because they were thrown in as optional characters, more or less for fun. They don't actually add a lot to the setting, only an extremely small amount. Both of them did have something to do with the plot, did have something to do with the setting, and it's about this much, I'll be completely honest with you. For the most part, they were thrown in because they wanted optional characters. It was something they'd never done before, and they would continue to do uh, a couple of times thereafter. You know, Vincent comes to mind, and Yuffie as well. But they were they wanted the idea that these characters are not obligatory and unfortunately due to the limitations of code and time and resources and facility in the SNES that meant these characters couldn't have a strong impact on the plot you know nowadays you could do something like that and have that character be a main part main part of the plot and only have them join you if you do something specific but back then it was either they don't exist, or they don't have a lot to do with the story, and so they went with the latter, and I think that was a good decision, again, at the time, because they are fun characters, and I do actually like Umaro and Gugu quite a lot, so shrug. Moving on. Other than those two exceptions, which, henceforth, I'm never going to mention again, every character in the game has more or less an equal share in, this, in the plot and the setting. Every character has moments of character growth, uh, often many of them. M every character in the game has something to add to the setting. Everything is something to add to the lore. You learn more about the world through these characters, and you learn more about these characters through the world. In both ways does the mirror go, and in all such cases, it really adds to the flavor, to the, the, the richness, the texture of the game. You know, we, uh, for, let me get back to the main character thing, for example. I have heard it said many times that you could say Locke is the main character, or Terra is the main character, or Celis is the main character, or Edgar is the main character. Those are the four I've heard the most argued for. And while I agree that those four characters do have a degree of, of severity about them to the plot, especially Terra, it is worth noting that while Terra, a lot of the early plot revolves around her, the plot as a whole does not revolve around Terra nor does it revolve around Edgar, nor does it revolve around Locke. All four of these characters I just mentioned have a great stake in what's going on and are integral to the plot, but are so equally, as are many additional characters thereafter. Sabin has just as much of a say in what's going on and just as much of a reason to be emotionally connected as Edgar does, and so does Cyan, if not more so. Of course, Cyan's is a little bit more personal, but we'll get into that later. You know, even Gal, to a degree that's difficult to explain, and I'll try and get into that later, has a very strong and valid reason for caring and for being here. And that's one of the great strengths of FF6, is having an ensemble cast that worked, that actually bothered to uplift every single member thereof, and not leave several off under the sidelines like they could have done very easily. It can be argued that some receive more backstory more development than others, but that's purely an artifact of, of practicality, because you do not have the entire party at the start. This is actually the reason why this is true. Oh, excuse me. Um, is because you start off with Terra, and then you get Terra and Locke, and then you get Terra and Locke and Edgar, and so forth and so on, right? So naturally, those three characters, and then Sabin, and then so forth and so on, get more development because they were there earlier, and they are in more segments of the game than Strago. But... Strago has just as much, from a character perspective, from a story perspective, just as much of a say, just as much of a stake, and just as much as an interest in the story and the plot and the setting as any of the others do. And he does nevertheless have a great deal of character development. It's unfortunately squished because it had to be because he didn't join the party until so much later into the game. But they still made the effort to make him matter, just like they made the effort to make Gal matter and Realm matter and Shadow matter, for goodness sakes. And so... I think they pulled that off absolutely flawlessly. Um, one of the other things they did very well with, with such an ensemble cast, you know, when you have an ensemble cast, you shouldn't just do it so you can have a lot of characters. No, 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 no. You need to use it, and for good reason. Again, this is one of those two things here. First of all, you have a lot of different characters with a lot of different abilities. So, you know, you've got blitzes, and you've got uh, sword techs, and you've got lores, and you've got rages, you know, all this fun thing, tools. This really added to the fun of a game a lot. You had so many fun little different things you could do rather than just attack and magic, right? awesome. But on top of that, they used that to help the narrative, to help the story, to help flesh it out. And one of the strongest ways they did that was by having each character have a different angle, a different perspective. 
what we had is 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 basically every major archetype and indeed several non-major archetypes represented within the party throughout Final Fantasy 6. And I'm not going to go over the details of them right now, but you know, we see the character who is the epic adventurer, that's Locke. Uh we see the character who is the king uh, well, you know, okay, Edgar. We've got Edgar, who is seeing things from on high. We've got Sabin, who is seeing things from the wild. We've got Shadow, who is seeing things pragmatically. We've got Gao, who's seeing things from the bottom of the wild, who's literally seeing things as a beast. We've got oh, uh, Realm, who's not only seeing things from a, chi- as a, from a child's perspective, but is seeing things from a, a very down-to-earth perspective, as I mentioned earlier. We've got Strago, who is also actually very down-to-earth, but also very wizened and has the elderly l- outlook. We've got Celis, who has has the bitter past thing going for her, but also has the fact that she's never actually functioned as a normal human being, and therefore is more soldier than she is person, and is trying to overcome that. I could go on and on and on and on about that. You get the point, though. There, every character has their own angle, their own perspective to provide. And through the cast, through this ensemble cast, we see the world, the setting, and the plot develop from all these different angles. And it gives us a, a spectrum, is what we end up having here. A wide spectrum of ideas and ideals that enable us to fully experience every single element and aspect of what they were trying to present to us. Oh my goodness. Now... Uh, speaking of character depths, this, this is the last thing I do before I start going to the characters themselves, because I do want to talk about each character individually, because this is FF6, damn it. Um, each character has a degree of depth that cannot be set, summarized by a sentence, and that's that itself is a bit of a summary, um, but that's kind of the point that I want to make right here, is that even when you look at Edgar, yes, he's a king, and yes, he is a romantic, but that's not all there is to him. And yes, he's an idealist, and yes, he's, you know... There are so many different things that, that define Edgar as an individual and Edgar as his personality. I like to use Edgar as an example, because most people, when they think of Edgar, they think, okay, he's, he's, uh, he's a floozy, and he's good with technology. And I'm like, were you even playing the game? (laughs) Edgar is like seven things, at least, all of them at once. He shows so many different shades and aspects to his character. He is sad and and, and, and proper and wise beyond his years and very intelligent and into women and has a great deal of, a great leadership capacity. It's worth noting that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Bannon sort of lost the reins of the Returners. The one he lost them to was Edgar. Edgar just kind of started taking over because he was a natural leader, unlike Bannon. Edgar was someone who was born to be that kind of charismatic leader and did so very well. And that's another aspect of his personality, and so forth and so on. I could keep going. But you get the concept here. Each character, all the way down to Gao even, or Mog if you prefer, is so different and so expansive to, to not just be able to be explained in a simple thing. And many of them, the, the, the subtleties of their characters were just discussed in subtle ways, in ways that you barely ever get to see. And indeed, in some cases, you don't get to see. Setzer is another beautiful example. The gambler who has an airship, I've heard, to describe Settler. But that doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of Setzer, you know? Let's talk about the characters individually. I Actually, I'm going to have a list here. Ever since I forgot poor... Uh, guy, I forgot his name. My goodness. Uh, Odo. Ever since I forgot Candorous Odo back in... Uh, back in KOTOR, I've, I've had a list of characters, so I don't forget anyone again. Because I had nothing against the man. Terra, of course, Terra. I mean, what is what else is there to say about her? She is a... Her amnesia was something I think that was a good move because her amnesia was not actually a plot-driven element. In FF5, Galoof had to have amnesia because if he didn't, he would know too much about the plot early on and he would reveal it too early to the audience in addition to the characters. It was, it was both perspectives there and it had to be fulfilled in order for him to, to work like that. So Galoof could not have the knowledge that he actually did. He had to have amnesia. Terra, by contrast, having amnesia only changed one thing, and it was only relevant to her, not the story. Because we find out that she knows and can do magic extremely early on, and and it is hinted that she can, literally in the very first scene, the very first scene, before we even know her name. Um, So what we have is a character who has amnesia, but only has so because, A, it serves her personal plot, but B, because it makes sense. This is the point I applaud here. She has amnesia because she should, because she has just been mind-controlled by something called a slave crown, which has basically ripped her free will away from her and and submitted herself to the 
the wills of lesser men, to put it simply. And that and, and has been forced to commit horrible, terrible acts. We see Kefka order her burn and kill his own men in order to prove that he can make her do it, and because it's fun. Um, that is an extremely traumatizing, brutal thing to happen, never mind the whole concept of your brain being taken away from you. Now, let's just ignore the trauma of being mind-controlled and, and add in all the other things that happened to her during this time. So, yes, of course she should have had amnesia, and it worked beautifully. And, of course, as usual, it was added as a gameplay element and as a narrative element, because as a gameplay element, it made it so you didn't get Morph right off the bat, but when you did get Morph, it was an awesome tool of, of really fun enjoyment that you could then use henceforth, and of course it had a narrative element because this is how we discover more about Terra as a character. Because one of her most powerful plot arcs in the first half of the game, up until she finds out what she is, is what am I? Or who am I, if you prefer. There was so much uncertainty in that poor young girl. There was so much worry and fear and and no idea how to deal with or handle everything there's so many scenes where she you know how do i know what is right or what should i do or what if the bad men come again i'm scared there is so i'm, I'm sorry my big brother instincts take over so hard for tara i just wanted to protect her and take care of her and give her a big hug because that poor girl was so frightened and so unaware of what to do or what she should do and literally just kind of being swept up into the flow she fell into the river and just barely managed to stay above the water and did better than most of us would do in her perspective in my personal opinion you know i i couldn't even imagine going through what she has gone through and then, of course, her her character arc doesn't just stay in that rut, because FF6 characters are not just a sentence, are not just a caricature. After she discovers what she is and how she is and what what's going on with her past and everything along those lines, she begins growing as a character and actually taking over the role essentially as the matron, as a mother figure, uh, not just for, you know, the obvious reason that where it's said flat out in Mobles, but she does tend to do that for the party even before that scene, and very much so after when we finally get her back into the group, Terra does become effectively the mother figure of the group. She has evolved, she has grown, she has learned how and what and who she is. Because her second character arc, still a matter of self-discovery, which is one of the big themes of FF6, is what is love? And a lot of people uh, back in the day, back in the news group era, were misinterpreting that as romantic love, as people tend to do. But it, that's not what we were talking about. Tara wanted to know what love was, and she finally found that in her children, in her friends, in her family, in the world as a whole. She learned what love actually meant to her, which is what it, which is what matters, and learned to actually care and express that caring through her actions, and is an amazing, powerful story, uh, amazing level of character growth, and I've just gone over the first character. Let's go over the next one here. Locke. Locke Cole. Poor Locke. Locke is another one of those characters who sh throws up a mask for a decent portion of the game. He he p p pawns himself off as a thief and as a, as a rebel, and his whole thing about, I'm a treasure hunter, not a thief, was actually a two-layer mask here, because first of all, he was pretending to be a thief, for reasons I'll get into in a moment, and then when people, and he was doing so obviously, but then when people told him he was a thief, he had another layer of mask on top of that saying, no, I'm a treasure hunter, because A, it called back to what he felt he really was, and B, it made them think that that was all there was to him. The easiest way to deceive others is to present to them what you think, what they... It's the Kansas City Shuffle is actually the term for this. You you let the others know through some subtle or gross means, I am deceiving you, and then you present a hint of what it is that I am try that I really am. But this is the real deception right here. This is what I am showing you intentionally. So you think this is what I'm hiding with this, when in fact I'm actually back here behind both layers. That's what Locke was doing that whole time. He was hiding, arguably, probably from himself as well, because Locke was consumed with guilt to an almost insane degree. It is it is uh, actually uh, very much hinted that the reason Locke joined the Returners was because he was a death seeker, because he was suicidal. He was so depressed, so lost after Rachel's death, supposed death, that he... He couldn't do, deal with it anymore. He couldn't do anything anymore. This is the woman he had loved again. Uh, this is actually one of the only examples of romantic love in the whole game, which I'll mention in more detail in a moment. Um, but this was a woman he had loved, he had cared for, he, he had he planned to marry. She had said yes, as he says. And he lost her 
twice and knew in the end that he had failed her twice. And that leaves a burden and a mark and a scar that is hard to emphasize. I actually know what that feels like personally in real life. And there, there's no words for what that does to a person. And so it is no surprise to me that Locke put on this carefree image because inside he was dying, or possibly, in his opinion, already dead. It wasn't until he finally found a purpose, which wasn't the Returners, because the Returners was doomed. It was. It really was a doomed prospect. It wasn't until Terra and Celis that he found purpose, that he found a reason to keep going and did so, and made the effort, made the strive. Locke, again, grows throughout the, car the the story as the game continues, mm -hmm. until it reaches the point where, you know, you're in the world of ruin. I'm going to skip forward a bit in his case. You reach the world of ruin, and you, you get the phoenix materia uh, <laughs> magicite. And it's worth noting that it is very heavily emphasized that Locke was when the world of ruin ended, when he lost his family, all the things that he had cared about, all the things that he had newly found as a reason to live were suddenly and violently ripped away from him. All he had left was a hope of a prayer that this Phoenix Magicite was a real thing, because at this point in time, he'd probably already heard the theories about Phoenix Magicite before, but he knew what Magicite was at this point in the story. He used it himself. He, he, he had interacted with it himself, you know, firsthand, and he knew exactly what it was, a dead esper, and that it converted its essence to magical essence. So, it makes perfect sense that he would have believed the story of the Phoenix, and having lost everything, would have devoted everything he had left in order to finding that, in order to getting Rachel back. I always take Celis when I go get... I'm actually really tearing up here. I always take Celis when I go and get Locke, because... Because Faith deserves to be rewarded every now and again, damn it. And because he deserved, she deserved, for that matter as well, a better life than that. And Rachel's gift to him, you know, I, I give you your life back. <laughs> that is my request and that is my gift to you, Locke. I give you your life back because it was stolen from you the moment I faded from it. That was powerful. I really am. Wow. Um... It was an amazing scene, an incredible level of character growth, and really speaks to the the extent that a character like Locke can grow and move, and move us, the, the players. Let's go ahead and talk about Celis next, but let's talk about the two before we segue here, shall we? Celis and Locke are the only except, uh, examples within the player base, uh, within the playable characters within the party, of romantic love being the theme between the two. Now... Uh, this is going to be a bit of a segue, which is why I want to discuss the separate of the characters. It is a common thing... <laughs> I'm still a little teary. It's a common thing in video games especially to have what is generally referred to as the token love interest. Because it really is just token. There's no feeling there, there's no emotion. It's usually uh, a little bit more physical than it probably should be for sex appeal. And whatever romance is there is either really poorly written or just kind of flair or tacked on, if you know what I mean. It doesn't add to the story, it doesn't add to the game, it doesn't add to anything. It's it's vestigial, or vestigial if you prefer, at best. And all you have as a result of that is something that you just shouldn't be there. You know, it's very rare that you see a romance done in a video game or a movie or a TV show or whatever and have it done properly. It always feels like it's interrupting the game. It feels like, it, the, or the story, it feels like you're having the story and then it's like, hey, hang on, hang on, guys. Okay, I love you. Oh, I love you. George, Masha. You know, and then it continues the story. It feels like it's a pause point, and it shouldn't in a proper romance. And Celis and Locke are one of the only exceptions I can think of of one that actually flowed perfectly naturally, developed extremely slowly, as it should, and were exactly where it should be as far as that kind of relationship. It makes perfect sense that Locke and Celis would end up together. And it's also worth noting that throughout the entire game, despite the hints, there are, there are a lot of hints for the two of them, but not teasing. This was, it was not done to tease. It was done as t hints because they themselves were hinting, because they were young. Celis is 18 in FF6 starts. That's worth noting. And Locke was like 21, I believe. I don't actually remember his name. I guess I could look it up since I got the list right here. Locke Cole is... 
Uh, 25, apparently. Wow, a little older than I thought. But the point is, 25, no offense, is still actually relatively young. And these two relative children, relative young adults at the very least, had no idea how to express their feelings for one another. And so it took them the whole game to get to the point where they could. It's also worth noting that, like I said, you know, a romance should not interrupt the plot, right? Well, from an in-character perspective, they didn't have time for romance because they were always trying to save the world. From the moment they met until the moment they succeeded, they were always busy. There was no time to sit as an aside and say, okay... You know how do we, let's work this out because a romance a relationship is a complicated thing and sh and it was pr and it was treated like that in FF6. The two of them always agreed to just kind of do their own thing until it finally culminated in one moment, which which still makes me cry. Oh wow, just thinking about it, I'm getting a little teary here. What can I say? It's Final Fantasy VI. It's during the ending, the first ending, and Celis. Uh, drops the, the necklace that Locke gave her and runs back to give it, but the bridge is giving out under her and she's about to fall, and Locke rushes out and grabs her hand and says the... Th oh, wow. Says that amazing line, I won't let go. I promise. And as the line, I promise, goes on the screen, they timed it, so that's when the the the, the trumpet, the, the glorious trumpet of the music starts up right in that moment as he says that, and he, he helps her up and saves her life and doesn't let go this time. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Don't mind me, I'm just crying in front of thousands of viewers. It's such a powerful scene, and that is exactly how a romance should be done in a video game. It took them the whole time to get there be for good reason, and the two of them, as a result of taking their time rather than rushing into a relationship, grew so much stronger and closer together as friends and as family and as lovers. And I like that, you know. I love that, in fact. I'll just put it honestly. That is moving. I've often heard people, you know, talk about pairing up other characters from the F from the party and and who would be with whom. And frankly, I don't. I personally don't think anybody would be with anybody, except for Locke and Celis, of course. You know, I don't think there needed to be any other pairings in that game. I think the one pairing was perfect, and all the other people were family. The other people were friends. The other people were more than family and friends. These were bonded through 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 they were a fellowship they were a bond they had bonds of fellowship keeping them together and i think it is appropriate that only the two ever became romantically involved during that now obviously romantic love was was present throughout npcs and other interactions throughout the game including of course Locke and rachel herself but i just felt like getting into that that discussion really quick here before i segue into the next character i want to talk about which is celis Celis very much has the uh, the Pinocchio story, as it's usually referred to as, which is funny because Terra had that to a degree, but not really because Terra was actually a fully fledged, uh, decent person who had lived as a person for many years, um, well, a few years at the very least, prior to uh, the circumstance. She had less trouble adapting once she finally realized, understood, and, and got past the mental blocks that had been on her. Celis, by contrast, was raised to be a soldier, was experimented on extremely young, and had only known the Empire and, and the General's life. She was more or less made by Geshtal, another tick, tick box on his crime list, in order to serve him, just like Leo was, just like Kefka was, and just like Terra was going to be. And Celis, when she finally reached a point where her own personal... where everything that she had done finally got to her, because Celis was not a bad person... It wasn't until she found out that Kefka was going to poison the people of Doma that she finally spoke up against it. And because she didn't have the loyalty that Leo that had been built up in Leo, she was uh, to a degree power-hungry, but not actually power-hungry, which is a little difficult to explain. And she was very much abrasive. She was very bru brusque. She was very much the ice of the character, which is appropriate, you know, and... She mainly objected to that based on the, the, the atrocity level of it, you know. And it's funny because she herself torched Miranda. This is another one of those excellent examples of something that wasn't directly plot relevant, but nevertheless very setting relevant that we are hinted at and that we are given signposts of that we never actually find out the full specifics of what happened. Excuse me. But it is my opinion that what most likely happened was Miranda was ordered to be torched by Celis, and something went bad there, and that's what began her process of, of turncoating. 
was because she didn't realize the full extent of what she was doing. Again, Celis was 18, and she, when she found out the next atrocity the Empire was going to commit through Kefka, she had had enough, and Trisoy to do, turn against it. But it is worth noting, again, she is more complicated than that. She hated herself for that. She actually looked down on herself for being a turncoat, for being a traitor, and was willing to accept death. It wasn't fighting, because she could have. She's Celis, but she wasn't trying to fight back. She was, she was accepting of her fate. In fact, told Locke, leave me. I deserve this. I am of no use to anyone, and Locke, of course, refused for good reason. But, you know, that is Cel- that's the beginning of Celis' story arc in a nutshell. Trying and struggling to interact with people in a non-war, in a non-military setting, which is something she'd never done before. She has such an awkwardness to her as she tries to grow more as a person. She does try, and she does try to interact with people more, and she has so many troubles with it. And but and she carries with her a massive guilt, a, a mountain of guilt on her shoulders, because she feels that all of the crimes of the empires are also hers. And she, of course, I- I- even ignoring that, she also was personally responsible for many atrocities, at the very least the torching of Miranda, as I just mentioned. And so when it reaches the point when you have the encounter in the Magitech Research Facility, Facility, and Kefka starts spewing his lies and, and twisting things because it's fun. <laughs> you know, it is no surprise that Celis is so bes- distraught and so thrown and so guilt-ridden at this circumstance that she takes the only out available to her. She chooses to go back to the Empire to save Locke because she believes that's where she belongs, not as a good thing. She believes she deserves the punishment of continuing to be associated with the Empire, even knowing that it would result in her friends and and the people she had already grown to care about and, and, and feel for love probably end up killing her, but that was okay. She was okay with that concept. She went along with that concept because she believed that's where it was. It wasn't until the Empire made peace that for the first time, Celis was capable of, of, of reasoning with herself, okay, maybe we could try for something better, and started reaching out to Locke, who was her closest friend amongst the Returners. It was the closest person that she felt towards, for obvious reasons, because he was the one who saved her. He was the one who had been there for her time and time again. And, excuse me, um... All of that is thrown into wonderful relief in the world of Ruin, which we see so much of from Celis' perspective. This is a woman who has, uh, who has again been a death seeker, who who has, has hated herself, hated the people she stood for, and had and had felt powerless. She wasn't actually powerless, but she felt it. She had that emotional baggage there, and all of a sudden the world ends. And as far as she is consciously aware of, Sid and her are the only living members remain. One of the lines that tends to squeak in in the translations, I don't even believe it was in the SNES version, is the fact that Sid and Celis were not the only people on that island originally. There were many survivors, probably dozens if not hundreds of survivors on that island. They're all dead now. Most of them committed suicide. And so Celis wakes up after having crawled herself out of all the the, the emotional and mental baggage she had into this situation. And it is no surprise to me, and indeed, uh, in an emotionally powerful scene when she herself tries to commit suicide. I've heard it said before that while Sid it is regrettable that Sid must die for this scene to happen. From a narrative perspective and from a story perspective, I agree, this is this is exactly how it should go. Sid dies, and Celis is left alone. Truly, utterly alone. And believes that there is no reason for anything, and understands at long last... And this is the great part, right here. At long last, she has the means and the availability and the, and no one to stop her from finally taking her own life. And when she does so, when she finally does so, she does so with tears in her eyes as she plummets off the cliff. Whoa. (laughs) Tearing up again. She does so with tears in her eyes because she realizes in her final moments as she's plummeting that she wants to live. And there there are no words for that. And when she sees Locke's bandana, her heart leaps. It, you can you can see it, you can feel it. The sheer exultation of the knowledge. He's alive. They're alive. Would be like drowning and drowning and drowning and all of a sudden reaching up and, and breaking the surface of the water and taking that first gasp of air. Celis was drowning her whole life. 
And it wasn't until that specific moment that she finally tasted air and wow you know and it is therefore absolutely logical and 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 per oh wow and perfectly reasonable that it is Celis that then gets the party back together. I've heard people say, why is it Celis that suddenly takes over the mem th this job? Why is it Celis is the one who works so hard to get everyone better? Of course she does! She just realized for the first time in her life that life was worth living. She wants to live, and she wants others to live, and she, for the first time, really is enthusiastic, really cares, really has finally, finally, finally been free of all the burden of guilt and fear and pain that has held her back her entire life. Of course she's the one who gets the party back together. Of course she's the one who talks everyone else into it. Of, you know, of the first four. Of course she's the one who pushes for it and convinces... S uh, Setzer is, is the beautiful example here. She is the one who talks Setzer out of his fugue because in him, in her, he sees everything he himself wants to be and realizes the truth of the pop probability of the situation. <sighs> and Celis's growth from then on is just amazing. And, and she, while well, I said, you know, Tara was the mother of, of the group, Celis becomes its heart. And I thought that was absolutely amazing. Let, let's go ahead and move on. I, I've got so many more to talk about. I'm only going to get one review to done tonight. But this is FF6, and it deserves it. Edgar. Edgar Roney Figaro. As I said, I like to use Edgar as an example of what, of a character that most people are like, yeah, he's a floozy, and he's into, into tech. And have, they have no idea. They're not even scratching the surface. Edgar actually has a lot of scenes, both in, in flashbacks and in actual scenes, that really demonstrate what kind of a character he is, what kind of a person he is. You see someone who is, as I've said before, wise beyond his years. You see someone who is marred with a terrible responsibility, but himself is a disciplined and good enough of a man to take that responsibility and rather than shirk it, rather than seek his freedom, which he longs for, he shows many times, he never says it outright, but he craves the freedom that Sabin took. But he himself knows that if he takes it for himself, others will suffer for his actions, for his selfishness. And he is ultimately a very altruistic individual and chooses instead to take upon him the burden of responsibility, the burden of leadership, so that others don't have to. And in Edgar, we see someone who is knowledgeable, who is intelligent, who is in his own way wise, who is uh, amusing, who who does not take his station as, as a writ rote of, of superiority, but rather takes it as, as a necessary burden, a necessary evil, if I might say so, and cares about his people, and cares about people in general. We see in Edgar so much, his character growth again, he starts off, and he's wearing a mask again. I'm not even just talking about the one where he's pretending to be, you know, the Empire's lapdog, because I'm talking about the one where he, he carries this mask of the floozy, this mask of the, the tech geek. And while, of course, he is, of course, interested in women, and that is an aspect of his personality, and while he is very much in te technology and is personally responsible for so many of the innovations that, that Figaro has un endured, the fact remains, these truths remain effective lies because, it, as I've many, said many times, the best way to lie is to say, tell the truth because nobody ever believes the truth. Or worse, in, in this specific case, as I'm trying to get to the point here, Edgar puts forth these truths and then just kind of sits behind them and all ever people see is these two truths about him and ignore the, the deeper aspects of his personality. And so much of his initial character arc has to do with his relation with his brother, with Sabin, and how betrayed he has felt by what Sabin did. Because even though he loved his brother, ultimately... And, and even though he is the reason Sabin had the freedom to go with the two-sided coin... Which, by the way, I just have to take a moment. That two-sided coin thing shows who Edgar is as a person. Is a person so well. He s chose for Sabin to have what he wanted and his freedom and his life, and took upon himself all the burdens and responsibility that would mean from Sabin leaving, not just his own, but Sabin's as well, because of how much he cared about his brother. And I just, I just love that. But anyways, his relationship with his brother and his, his resentment towards his brother, his, his jealousy of his brother and, and the freedoms and the, the openness. You know, when you first see, find Sabin's house and Edgar starts looking around and noticing the different things that were of Sabin's, you can almost feel the almost... Uh, ch uh, 
the almost innocent, there we go, that's the word I want to use, the almost innocent longing that Edgar has for his brother to, to, to have that relationship with his family again, that he has been going without for years, that he has been living without because he had to, because he chose it, because that was how things went. And when he finally encounters his brother, he's overjoyed. But as as time goes on, you see the fact that there is a bit of resentment, there is a bit of, of, of darkness there that he works through. And he does that fairly quickly, all things considered. You know, Before we even get halfway through the world of balance, he reaches a point where he finally settles in and acknowledges what his brother did and and accepts what his brother did and reconciles with him and it's funny because it isn't until the ending of the game that Sabin has a wonderful line and I mentioned this because it's per- directly pertinent to Edgar Sabin is saves Edgar's life and says I didn't abandon you I didn't abandon Figaro I went to far to help watch and and take care of and I knew that someday you would need my services again so I trained so that I could help you when that day came. And we see in that simple sentence, not even said by Edgar, we see so much of the emotion that Edgar himself had felt through the entire game towards his brother. Because there was, even though he worked through so many of those issues, there had to have been still a wound. There was a wound of grief and an abandonment, almost betrayal, at what his brother had done. Even though he had given him the option, the fact that his brother took it, you know? Had, bo- had to have bothered him all the way until the end of the game, and we see all of that through Edgar's eyes, and I, I, I'm going to go ahead and stop here. I could keep going, and I'm going to try and start cutting these a little bit shorter, but I really like the way... I really like Edgar. He's actually one of my favorite characters in the game, and uh, like I said, the coin toss says so much about his character in a nutshell. The other thing that says a great deal about his character in a nutshell is how much effort and time and work he put forth into saving his people in Figaro in the world of Ruin. All the effort he went through in order to save them there was incredible and really speaks to him as a character. Speaking of which, let's go ahead and go on to Sabin René Figaro, who is the next character on my list here. Sabin, of course, has his own... It, it's much more difficult to define Sabin's character arc because so much of what he does is reacting. So much of he does is trying to deal with extraordinary circumstances that have been put upon him, that have been forced upon him, and he just has to kind of deal with it, and he doesn't have time to really sit and think about it. All of his story arc, uh, when it does the three-branch thing, choose a scenario, Kupo. When it does that little thing, and you go through Sabin's scenario, everything that's happening there isn't Sabin... Uh, how do I put this? He's taking on things, and he's learning, and he's growing, but he doesn't actually have a chance to deal with that yet, because everything that is happening is one a nor- a horrible circumstance after another, just kind of berating him until it finally gets to the point where he can actually sit and think about it, and then we finally see what Sabin actually, how Sabin actually develops as a character. We also find out a lot about Sabin through other characters and through the flashbacks. We learn that Sabin is... Uh, a lot more emotional than his brother, a lot more hot-headed, I would probably go ahead and say, and very much more driven by his heart than his mind. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's a very different thing than his brother, who is very much, you know, mental, very much intellectual. Sabin is someone who wants to do and wants to do it now, damn it. And he shows that constantly through all of his actions. Uh, throughout the game, and one of my favorite examples of Sabin and his his character growth, his character movement, is he he starts off almost uh, reckless, almost rash, actually, and basically in several circumstances, which I'm not going to define in detail here, it takes the easy way out or the quick way out when he probably should have taken more time and actually bothered to help and and grow and work and move rather than just say, okay, here's the answer, let's go. By the time of the World of Ruin, the fact that he... Uh, this is this is probably reading into it a bit much, but the fact that he was willing to stand there and hold the house up while you went in and saved the child, rather than trying to rush in himself like he would have when he was still younger, back in the world of balance and less experienced, really speaks to his growth as a character and how much he has matured, how much he has started to uh, basically grow up more and, and learn to think ahead and learn to function, because he's always been the same personality-wise. He was a good person. He wanted to help. He wanted to help do things. You know, for the sake of others, but he was so rash about it and so childlike about it in his early days that he had problems with it. And it wasn't until later on that he grew and and learned and and ex- was experienced and, and elderly enough, basically, in order to finally say, okay, here's how we're going to do things, and we're going to do things right. 
And uh, I can also speak to Sabin. One of the scenes I like about Sabin in the world of Ruin, when he finds his master again, you really do see Sabin as he is there, because he openly and without shame weeps at knowing that his master has survived, because because he cared, because that's the kind of person he is, because Sabin is the kind of person who is very emotional, and and is and by in the early days he would hide that sort of thing. You know, when he found out about what was happening. Uh, with 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 his parents, he ran off in tears. But when you finally encounter him there in the world of ruin, he is no longer ashamed of said tears. He is no longer ashamed of who and what he is, and he has grown enough to accept himself in order to be a better person for his own ends and for the ends of others. Let's go ahead and move on to the next guy here, Cyan Garamonde. I like Cyan. I like Cyan a lot. In the original SNES version, they gave him a thee and thou speech. It's been fixed a lot in the remake, because, uh, you know, proper translation. The same thing happened to Frog over in Chrono Trigger, actually. Same exact thing, basically. But Cyan is a fascinating character, and arguably one of the most character growth characters in the series. In in, in I'm sorry, not in the series, but in the game, in FF6. Cyan is someone who starts off as in almost an idyllic perspective, if you know what I mean. He is a knight, of course. He has his own code of honor, of course. But he has a wife, a child, a kingdom who who knows him and he knows them. He is well-liked. He is well-respected. He is living, essentially, the life he has always wanted to live. He is, he is serving his king and his country, and he has his family who loves him and who he loves. And he is basically at the top of the world right at the beginning of the game. You know, and then Kefka comes along and takes away all of that from him. And what happens then is interesting, because for someone who is so reserved and so uh, knightly, so so noble, in a, in a real sense of the word, not, you know, a, a, a not real sense of the word, um, to see him so utterly break and turn to psychoticism, for lack of a better way to call it, was really impactic and really powerful, because even right on, early on we get a hint of how calm and intelligent and reserved and disciplined of a man this is and he breaks down to the point of screaming and assaults the imperial camp by himself and it's also worth noting that Cyan did so with no real intention, no plot, no no advance warning or thought of anything other than to lash out. The sheer rage and hatred he felt there was incredible and extreme and as we learn throughout the game and as we finally work, help him work through it Cyan blamed himself for all of that. He felt that if he had done better, that he if, if he had been a better father, a better husband, and a better knight, a lord, uh, a lord for his his kingdom, then he could have prevented these horrible tragedies from happening. And all that he was able to do was stand and watch. He was just standing on the catapults, wa- or the catapults, watching when the river was poisoned, when everyone died, and when the train comes in the Phantom for- Forest and the, takes away his people, all he can do is watch them leave. He can't help them, he can't save them, he can't bring them back, he can't go with them. And it's also worth noting that I very much got the impression, very early on, that Cyan was, <laughs> I know this seems to be a common theme, but Cyan was, was, was willing to die, wanted to die even. In two instances he actually tried that, first in the attack of the camp, and second, as he's chasing after the train, you get the very strong impression Cyan is, is thinking about leaping onto the train, even knowing it will take him to the afterlife, or whatever it is in FF6 terms, even knowing that that will mean his death, he was still willing to do so instantly and without hesitation. And thus, Cyan grows as a character throughout the game because he begins to realize as time grows on that he has... How do I put this? He has a responsibility to his new family, the, part, the, the party members, the, the party that you, you gather together, and he has a responsibility to the world as a whole, which is his new home instead of Doma. And because of these two new things, he finds new purpose and manages to get the strength to continue. But it's not until you have his character arc at Doma Castle that he is finally able to do the most critical thing of all and the most difficult thing of all. Anyone watching this video, and I myself as well, knows that when you've done something horrible or something you carry a tremendous amount of guilt for, the single most difficult thing to do is to forgive yourself. And Cyan might not have even forgiven himself. He might have truly and utterly surrendered to despair and to hopelessness and to all of those things because of how much he hated himself. And 
that was incredibly powerful the way that was presented in in all of its formats you know when he talks about the girl uh, Lola he he met he meets from Miranda and he talks about the letters he was sending her because as he says it himself something inside of me snapped the, the, this world is so wrong and so broken and I can do so little about it and it isn't until he finally forgives himself and accepts who he is and what he is that he is able to truly walk up and stand for the first time since be, since the game began and say, I am Cyan Garamonde. And I, you know, I, I am myself, I am real, I am a person, I am going to save this damned world. <laughs> you know? I, I really like Cyan. Um, let's go ahead and hit the next character here. Uh, let's scroll down a bit. Gao. Gao. Um, Gao is amusing because Gao is one of the characters. Gao and Mog both, and I'll cover both, are uh, two characters that t people tend to point to and say, "There's no characterization there. They have no say." Yes, they do. They have characterization. They have de depth to them. Gao is a character who we learn almost everything about him through a single scene, much later in the game in the World of Ruin, one of those optional scenes and through the way he presents himself, from the way he acts and reacts to things. Yes, he's the wild child. Yes, he's the one who's been raised by beasts. But we also see someone who is incredibly intelligent, someone who feels incredibly maligned, someone who has had the capacity, and it is, is demonstrated many times, he has had the capacity to come back to civilization, to make a life for himself, and has actively chosen not to because of how much he believes that certain aspects of civilization are in fact worse than living in the wilds. That he, and so we see from Gao a perspective of someone who sees the world as a place that has only been getting worse and worse as time gets on, and someone who, when he has finally presented the opportunity almost accidentally to try and help make the world a better place, leaps onto it without hesitation, without fear, without regret, leaps on it. Boom, like that, because he wants to make the world a better place. He wants civilization to be better so he can rejoin it. And he makes the effort to rejoin it when you finally start making progress in that in that end. That's Gal. And Gal is a good kid, too. You know, that wonderful line, Father happy, you know, Father alive, Gal happy, is amazing and really speaks to how much he still cared, even knowing, because Gao is not stupid. Gao understands what his father did. Gao knows what his had been done to him by his father and by his insanity, and the fact that his mother was no longer amongst the living. And those are terrible things for anybody to take. But Gao nevertheless took them in stride and took them with a smile, because at the end of the day, his father was alive and well, and that was enough. And even though he had tried and made the effort and wanted to reach out to his father, his father could not reach back, and Gal was okay with that. Because his father, segregate of himself, was alive and happy. And Gal would be able to be at peace with himself knowing that. So, there's Gal. Let's go ahead. Who's next on the list here? Where am I? Setzer. Setzer Gabbiani. I already mentioned Setzer is a pretty obvious one for, for being more in-depth than he looks. Um, right up there with Locke, actually. Yes, of course, he's the gambler. Yes, of course, he has that devil-may-care attitude. All of that is explained in, in required uh, cutscenes. You know, the, when we talk about... Um, I suddenly can't think of her name. Meryl, I believe? Shoot. Uh, ah, what was her name? Give me just a second here. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Daryl. I'm sorry. One letter off. Daryl. Was the uh, was the woman? He and her, whatever there was between them, is left to the imagination, which I think is how it should be. I personally don't think it was romantic. I think he and Daryl were basically brother and sister, a relationship I understand, obviously, and were very close to each other and very competitive with each other, and blah 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 blah. And I think that something inside him died when he lost Daryl, when she faded away, and what was left was someone. If you can imagine this for a moment, if the core of his being, the heart of his being, if you will, died, and there was nothing left there except this emptiness, but his shell kept going. And so what we have is a man who is completely on the surface, and so he does jobs for the Empire, and he uses his airship to, to shuttle and to make money and to get his little gambling things going on and to, to heck with the, everything and the odds given it all. But all of that isn't so much a mask as it is 
a fakery, a false, a for... Uh, yes, it is a mask, but it's not a mask to deceive other people. It's a mask because there is no setzer underneath that mask as of that point. There is only the mask. And it isn't until he encounters Celis and hears about how things are going with her and finds someone who actually manages to create a spark in him. Not romantic spark. Yes, he wanted to marry her, but that's unrelated. It really is. That whole marrying thing that I'm going to take... Uh, um, I can't think of her name, the the opera singer. Maria. I'm going to take Maria as my bride thing, and the whole I'm going to take Celis in place of Maria as my bride thing. That was still the mask talking. It wasn't until he and Celis actually started interacting, and Celis bested him and, and talked to him, and, and they start interacting, and Setzer starts growing with the party and caring about these other people, that Setzer starts to exist underneath that mask. And the mask just kind of melts away to the point where by the time we start to see any scenes with any real action, interaction with Setzer, the mask is gone, just as though it never was, and in its place is actually Setzer, the actual man, the man who cares, the man who values freedom, the man who values uh, personal triumphs, the man who thinks that lives matter, the man who wants very much in order to not just experience the glories of life, but to share them with others, you know, the man who stro strove for for these for these things and the wonderful scene the optional scene I mentioned earlier that you have with Setzer when you go way over on the other side of the continent to see him and he talks about Daryl in, in not directly but in passing and he talks about the ship and why the ship is so important to him really spoke to the character and of course all of this culminating in when you he when Celis goes there excuse me when Celis interacts with with Setzer in the world of ruin and Setzer having finally abandon his shell, and, and again, this is a very similar situation to, to several of the characters I've just mentioned, including Celis herself. You know, when Setzer had finally, uh, Locke as well is actually a really important one, when Setzer finally had, had grown and, and learned and, and, and moved past all of his his past, had moved beyond his past, had, got, had gotten rid of his, his problems and his mask, and had finally become Setzer again, and then the world was destroyed, and everyone he just cared about and, and loved and had worked for was gone, including his airship, which is very important. His ship was gone, his wings were gone, his friends were gone, all of it was gone, and he was just sitting in a bar in Kochlingen, drinking the night away. And it wasn't until Celis shows up a year later, and like I said earlier when I was talking about Celis, in her, he sees everything he wants to be true, everything he wants to be, and he decides to do what Setzer does and takes a chance and takes a, takes a, takes a risk and says, you know what? to hell with it, to hell with despair, to hell with the grief, to hell with depression. Let's go. Let's try. You know, <laughs> my chip is a light, is my, my life is a chip in your pile. Annie up. I love that. So, and, and Setzer, that, that's Setzer in a nutshell, you know, he, he finally manages to triumph in spite of himself and in spite of what he used to be and in spite of what he wasn't. And, maintain truth towards himself. You know, being true to yourself. I mentioned that earlier. Let's go ahead and move on to the next character really quick. Shadow, that's another one that a lot of people are like, ah, there's no complexity there. Now, granted, Shadow you have to work at, but there are two big things that, that are worth mentioning about Shadow. One is the incredible scene between him and Terra when they're on the boat going towards the Massa, where Shadow has this wonderful line. It's only like three lines total, but he tells Terra, you have to keep in mind that there are people in this world who have deliberately and intentionally killed their emotions, like myself. Keep that in mind, you know? And in that, we see someone who has undergone something that's hard to explain to anyone who has never experienced it themselves. This is someone who has... Uh, granted, all of these characters have some degree of a tragic backstory, but Shadow... His reaction to that tragedy, his reaction to that backstory, was to choose not to feel. He actually deliberately chose to hone himself and discipline himself to the point where he didn't feel. And the, the greatest irony there is the fact that as the game goes on, Shadow begins to realize that he never actually succeeded. That while he was very disciplined, that while his professionalism and his, and his training managed to keep down all of the emotions, they were ultimately submerged and hidden, not actually destroyed. And when we finally start encountering him... Um, on the, on the uh, floating continent is where we first start to see Shadow beginning to accept the fact that he isn't just a, a mercenary, he isn't just a cold-blooded kidder, he is actually a person, and Shadow himself starts to realize that and starts to say, 
huh. And the best part of it all is that Shadow says, Shadow likes that fact. Shadow likes the fact that he is actually a person underneath all of that. And there's a reason, you know, he cares so much. He bothers so much. He tries so much with the party. Because he could have just gone and done his own thing in the world of Ruin. But by that point, he had learned a very important fact. And that was the fact that his daughter was alive and well. And he wanted to make a better world for her. It is very debatable what happens to Shadow at the ending. I've heard a lot of theories... I hesitate to put mine own forward. But I will go ahead and say that what it does appear to be is that Shadow believes that having done all of these acts and and successfully saved the world, he he heads off, sends Interceptor off to go with Realm, and finally accepts the fact that he is no longer going to run from what he believes to be his proper fate, which is death in this case. And the only reason he's letting himself do this now he could have killed himself much earlier. He First, his professionalism, his, his, his discipline kept him going. And then he realized he still cared and still felt. And from that point until the end, just like several other characters realized throughout the course of the game, he had a reason to keep going. He had a reason to fight. His daughter, if absolutely nothing else, was alive and well, and he wanted to make a better world for her. And Shadow's story is much, you know, all, so many of the characters I mentioned before are very altruistic, very good, very giving. Shadow is not a bad guy, but Shadow cares about Realm. Shadow is making a better world for Realm. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but he has a very direct and very personal relationship to her, and, and to uh, that connection is what keeps him going, rather than something more vague and general like several of the other characters do, and I think having that contrast was an excellent decision. And so, having succeeded, having defeated Kefka, having created the better world for his daughter, he now feels that at long last he can accept a fate that he, w he should have had years and years and years ago, before the game even began, and finally, as he himself puts it, stop running. Whether or not he lives through that or not is purely left to the imagination, and I think that is exactly how it should have been. Because everyone could think in their own way what they believe it should be, both narratively speaking and from what they would want for the character. For those who are curious, I think he survived. I think he lived, and I think he went back to Thamasa and, and reunited with Realm and had the life he should have had from the beginning. That's just my opinion, though. Next on the list... Uh, Realm. Realm Arony. I suppose that would be Shadow Arony then. Actually, I don't remember his actual name. Mm. Um, Realm is difficult to discuss as a character because her character arc is so short, just like Strago's is. But we do see in Realm someone who is very is very much a childlike uh, or an innocent perspective, and at the same time is someone who tries very hard not to be. Someone who is actually trying so so hard, too hard, one might argue, that to not be a child. That we instead see someone who has undergone the discipline necessary, the training necessary, this mental reconditioning and emotional reconditioning to actually become more than a child and to be more than the sum of her parts and to actually provide a bit of a I don't even know how to call it properly. A bit of a, 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 a as strange as this is going to sound, the wise woman perspective for the party, the one who who actually has insight and and uh, things to share with regards to the others. And we also see in her a almost desperate desire for normalcy. We see in Realm someone who does not want to undertake these... This is another one of those down-to-earth things. She doesn't want to be the hero. She doesn't want to be the one who fights the, the innumerable hordes and the gigantic monsters and stands on floating continents as they're falling apart around him and watches the world be destroyed. Realm didn't want any of that. Realm wanted to just live her life with her family and her dad and... And, and be happy and, and be comforted and paint. You know, she wanted to be a painter. That's such a gimmicky thing when you look back on it. Most people think of it in terms of the game perspective. But Realm's painting really speaks to her as a character because ultimately she just wanted to have her quiet, unassuming little life of painting. And that says a lot for her as a character. And it's worth note that the very first thing she does in the world of Ruin is, in her own childlike way, refuse to submit to the despair and the horrors that the world has presented her, and instead say, well, I'm out. And she goes and becomes a painter. And she makes her dream happen. And it isn't until the party comes along that she realizes that there is still a quest to be had, that there's still a chance at actually saving this world. And it is also worth noting that Realm, a young child, 
does not hesitate even a second when it comes time to go and save the world. She abandons the life she wants to live, that she has chosen to live, that she has wanted all her life without question or hesitation in order to go make the world a better place because that is Realm. And I like Realm. Um, Strago, Strago Magus, is a fascinating character in his own right. Again, his character arc is necessarily shrunk for obvious reasons, but what we see in Strago is someone who is... Uh, Sid back in FF4 was the I'm still young character, you know. He was an elderly, uh, not an elderly man, but an older man, but nevertheless acted as though he was young. There's a name for that archetype, and I don't remember it, but that is very much what Strago is. But the reason he tries to cling to his youth is, is actually rather d deeply personified. Most people in real life cannot look at something like Strago's obsession with Hidden and believe that that would be a significant enough thing life-altering thing to completely change how your personality is for the rest of your life. But if you really think about it from an in-character perspective, it makes perfect sense. And the more you think about it, the more sense it makes. Strago was truly obsessed with this creature, and we get a very strong hint that there was a reason why. He wasn't just m monster hunting, although he did do that. He wasn't just learning about the world, although he did do that. This was something that had done something to him or someone he loved. And it is my personal theory that it is very likely that the that Strago's daughter, who you know Realm's mother, is someone, or actually I don't believe it is actually Realm's mother, but you know it's someone close to Strago, possibly Realm's daughter, or I'm sorry, Realm's mother, was killed by Hidden, and that is one of the reasons he held onto that grudge for so long, and why when it came to the point when he finally came, returned home and found out about Hidden, he had to go after it. It was such a burning sore, a, 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 a fire in the back of his brain that had been there all this time. And then he, had, it, when we live with things, the human brain, the human mind, the human body is so adaptable. You know, if I were to hold this pen here against my palm like this, this actually hurts, right? But if I keep doing this for another like five, six, ten, thirty, forty minutes, I will just stop feeling this. It still hurts. I'm not going to do that. It still hurts, but I stop feeling it because I've adapted to it. Strago had adapted to this burning in the back of his brain of that about Hidden and all that Hidden had done to him and his failure, the fact that Hidden had, in his perspective, in his opinion, spit in his face because he had failed to take it down, and that is also, that it also brought Strago down because Strago himself had failed. He had failed Realm, in my particular incident, and more importantly, he had failed himself because he was not enough of a man to go out and take down Hidden. And when he found out Hidden was there and had been re-revealed, that fire all of a sudden that he that had been dull and in the quiet back of his mind that he had forgotten about all these years st just struck a flame and with it, there's a reason why he immediately would was like okay we're going and at first he was going to go alone and then it it became very quickly apparent that the party was going to go with him Th that scene is a little poorly coded it has a few couple issues with it but long story short you do get the very strong impression that you know Strago was not alone in that fight, and there's a good reason for that. And he was actually very grateful, even though this was something he wanted to do, that he didn't have to do it alone. That he probably could, if he, and if he chose to say, I want to go with this alone, the party would have respected his wishes. But he was too grateful and too moved by having people who cared about him enough to take on this ancient vengeance and this vendetta for his sake that he was more gratified than, than insulted and, and took their help gratefully. And that's Strago. Uh, only one more I've got here, and that would be Mog. Slam dance and Moogle. Mog is interesting because talking about his character is extremely difficult to do because everything we know about him is inferred. I'm actually going to talk about him only in brief. You know, we, we, we find out that he is uh, one of the most intelligent of the Moogles, that he can talk, of course, that he can communicate uh, magically we don't actually know why. We are There are hints that are given that the Mughals are simply that sufficiently strong or special for him to actually hear, you know, Ramu and all the things that he was taught, uh, told by him. And of course, Mog has the availability to to command the the the, the Sasquatches. We we assume there's more than one, but we only know about Umaro. Excuse me. And so, what we have here, personality-wise, is someone who very clearly shows elements of happy-go-luckiness and lightheartedness and all that sort of thing, right? I mention this all because in the world of Ruin, there's a scene that still makes me cry 
to this day. And it's hard to explain it to, to most people. It's the scene when you go and get him in the world of Ruin. And you, you go into the town, and he's there, and he is alone. This is important, because in the world of balance, there were dozens upon dozens of Moogles, all moving and, and running around and having fun and all that fun stuff. Where are all the Moogles in the world of Ruin? Now, depending on how you interpret this, and it was left to interpretation on purpose, which, I, again, I think was a good thing, you can define this as either the Moogles have left, or they have become lost, or that they're dead, that Mog is the last Moogle, and he is standing on a specific spot in the room, looking down, looking sad, I, I should say, you know, having, having the, the grief-stricken animation or, or pose or whatever you want to call it going on, and he's staring at this spot on the ground. And after you recruit him and you pick up the item that was there, you find the Moogle charm, which in certain editions is defined as a ribbon that was given to Mog from someone that was special to him. You, you get where I'm going with this. Mog... As, as so many of the characters were, was so shocked with grief that all he could do was stand in the former home of his fallen comrades and stare at this last memento of, of, the, of the other Mughal, whatever they were. Maybe they were a mother, maybe they were a lover, maybe they were a sister. We don't know. But we, we, he's just staring at this memento that's all he has left of her. That is the only thing remaining of her, because it's they're gone and she's gone. And it isn't until the party shows up. And he actually has this look of shock, because it is such a shock to his system that, oh my god, you're still alive. And he realizes in that moment that he still has a family. You know? That he still has... A, 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 a people, a, pur a reason, a purpose to keep going, and people to keep trying for. And you can almost see the tears of joy on his face at the realization that he isn't alone because he thought he was. Because he thought he'd lost the party when the world was destroyed, and he did lose his family, his, his Mughals, thanks to the events of the World of Ruin. That one scene speaks volumes for that character, and, and how lighthearted and innocent and... and grievous he had been, and it is uh, it's awesome. Now <laughs> let's scroll up a bit to hit my little checklist and then we'll finally call this in. I haven't actually looked at the time yet. I'm, I'm not going to. And, oh my gosh it's, okay, it's kind of late, so this video's probably been going on a while. The music of Final Fantasy VI is nothing short of pure artwork. It's poetry. It's amazing. It is incredible. I love the music of Final Fantasy VI. It is incredible. It's indicative. I've actually been listening to it myself this whole time. <laughs> um, I'm on the Velt right now, because it's on random. But the music is exactly what it should be. This is going to sound a little bit trite, because there's only so much I could say, but the music is exactly what it should be. It was beautiful music. It set the scenes. It set the tones. It got the emotions across. FF6 was very good in terms of music for being very emotional music, for, ver for being more than just competent or good to listen to. You really feel what is supposed to be felt in those. You know, the sad music is genuinely heart-rending, and the happy music is generally happy, and the uplifting song is only cautiously uplifting, as it should should be, you know, blah, 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 blah. All of it was done absolutely amazingly. And Nabum, it's really outdid himself with Final Fantasy VI. This is arguably one of my favorite of the soundtracks. Actually, it is my second favorite of his soundtracks, the first being four, for anyone who's curious. Now, the last dungeon of FF6, Kefka's Tower, is again, has an amazing song. Not my favorite last dungeon song, but definitely one of the best. Uh, I'd say probably third best, if I had to put a number on it. And with first best being Final Fantasy IV, for anyone who's curious, and second best actually being FF7, believe it or not. But FF FF6 Last Dungeon song, which is called The Last Dungeon, is the first one he called that. And Kefka's Tower was just incredible. Kefka's Tower itself, the amalgamation of, of debris, of chunks, and actually reusing set pieces from earlier points in the game and just adding on to them or re redirecting how they worked was a, was a work of genius. It actually worked really well. And the new tile set showing off the literal debris and the junk that had been put together, because that's what Kefka's Tower was, which also speaks well to the villain. I'll get to that in just a moment. You know, but the tower itself was long, was amazing. The three-party system, the whole time, the reason they'd done that multiple-party system, which I haven't talked about yet, actually, but 
in very brief, it was an amazing idea and worked very well, and I kind of wish they'd kept doing that. The last, the next time they would actually try anything like that at all would be NFF8, and that didn't work out nearly as well. But the multi-party system was a, was a work of genius, in my opinion, and really actually really helped flesh out the game both in narrative terms and in gameplay terms, because what we have in FF6 is actually a first, and indeed an only. In FF6, the entire party, well, with like two exceptions, depending on how many people you recruit, is present at the last boss. The whole party is. All the whole ensemble cast. And this is why they did this in six, because six was an ensemble cast. There was no main character. Everyone had to be there. And so they specifically and intentionally went out of their way to create this three party system of going through the tower, specifically so that everyone would be there for the last fight. Everyone would be this is also why they did the last boss is the way they did, which I'll get to in a minute. Everyone would have to be able to have a say. They wouldn't necessarily do that in FF seven or FF four or FF eight because there's a main character. The main character's there, the rest are there and re matter and have relevance, but it doesn't necessarily matter so much because the main character is there. If the if there any other party members are rotated out, it's not as relevant. The only one that's relevant is the main one. You follow what I'm saying here? So they created this system so that the entire party would be there in the last dungeon, with two exceptions. And they created the last boss system so that the entire party would be able to fight the last boss. The way they did it is you had to you had to number your characters, and the first four were your initial party. Anytime anyone falls in that four, the number five slot moves up into that. And so what you have is the whole party essentially fighting them. Not at once, of course, because the technology didn't exist, but you get what I'm saying here. Which brings me to, let's go and talk, discuss the last boss before we get into that. Last boss, FF6, is unfortunately the beginning of the end, uh, or rather is actually the, 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 the official we've leapt over the cliff part. Because in FF5, as I mentioned, X-Death wasn't that hard, but he was still at least challenging. In FF6, Kefka was pathetic. I'm sorry, but he was. Even if you hadn't leveled that much, Kefka was not a difficult fight, and neither was the, the three goddesses as you go up the tower. It was just relatively simple and easy, and, and they had some interesting abilities, and they could have done some interesting things with them, but they didn't. They intentionally toned him down, because this is the point in time which they had officially and formally adapted that new uh, philosophy of doing things in that manner. And... Whether that's a good thing or not, ultimately is, of course, going to depend on your opinion. I personally think it is a bad thing. I think after everything that Kefka has... Uh, had done, and... <laughs> after everything that Kefka had done, after everything he had been, after everything he had been built up to be, he should have been a much more difficult fight. Kefka, in my opinion, is one of those mages who is a lot stronger than he looks, and a lot more power and a villain who is a lot more powerful than he looks and the fact that he takes himself no so non seriously is kind of the point and he should have been an immensely challenging fight and he wasn't and neither was the tower leading up to him it's almost a shame because the last boss song to to finish my little section here was incredible dancing mad is one of my favorite last boss songs like i was saying earlier it's one of the top ones easily without hesitation without question um and my goodness, you know, that song was incredible, it was epic, it was awesome, it was impacting, it was everything the fight should have been, and wasn't. It's it's one of my only disappointments about FF6. I've actually played several uh, modified versions on emulators of FF6 that change around several of the stats and the perspectives of the game, and one of those, uh, actually one of the ones I made too myself, but which I have since lost, unfortunately, uh, made Kafka a lot harder, and all of a sudden, that bottle goes from being kind of a joke to incredibly awesome. So, go figure. But let's talk about the let's talk about the remake now, because I want to finish with with my final thoughts here on on the next subject, the only subject I haven't touched on yet. The remake uh, was a proper remake. The only reason I tend to think of it as not one of the best for proper remakes is because it could have done so much more and didn't, but the FF6 remake, the FF6 Advance on the Game Boy Advance, did add to the game. It added new summons, uh, new espers, rather. It added uh, new dungeons, two of them, and it added a degree to the plot, and most importantly of all, it, re it fixed all the translation issues. As I've said before, Final Fantasy VIII was the first FF to actually have a proper translation. Every game before that had translation issues. Six is no exception to that. And Six on the SNES did have scenes and pro where, where there were just problems, where you weren't actually sure what was happening, or why, or what was going on, or anything of that sort. And so, that is something that, by itself, in, in all honesty, is something that I would consider to, at the very least, be worth consideration in purchasing that remake. And of course, they did refine the combat system, not a lot, but a little, and they did add to the, uh, 
lore in the background because, of course, fixing the translation helps the story and helps the scenes, but also helps fill out the characters and fill out the background, fill out the setting, because you can have those random NPCs in town say something that is much more in-depth, that makes much more sense if you if you have that set up properly like that. So, And uh, admittedly, that's basically all I have to say about the FF6 remake. It's almost unfortunate, but I do want to share one quick story about the FF6 remake. I wasn't following uh, gaming news at that time because I was in a place in my life where I didn't really have uh, a steady job. I was working at Hardee's uh, for no pay, actually. That turned out to be a bit of a problem. But I was getting trained to be a manager there and was getting set up for that. And so I was at a place where I wasn't watching gaming news because, frankly, I couldn't afford it. I remember distinctly I got woken up very early. I was still in the night shift back then, as I am now. I was woken up very early by my roommate, Eric, who comes in and says... Archie and Gaia, except he didn't call me that. You know, blah. Um, you need to get dressed so we can head out right now. And my first response was, why? Sounding really irritated. And he says, I'll tell you on the way there. I was like, okay. Now, I trusted Eric just enough to go ahead and go with him on this. And flung my clothes on, got out. I was ready to go. We get in the car, and I'm like, all right, what? And he's like, uh, Final Fantasy VI for the Game Boy Advance, a remake just came out. And I was like, why aren't you driving faster? <laughs> because, oh my god, I didn't even need a second to think about that one. I didn't really have that much money at the time, but that purchase was one I did not regret, still don't regret. I still have that game on me, in fact. It's over in the knock there. And, uh, I, I just, it, it's worth noting that the the remake was proper, the remake was good. I wish it was more, to be honest. I wish they'd do the 3DS remake that they were going to do and then dropped because they're retards. But that remake was it was an excellent game, and I, I went out and bought it the day it came out without question, without hesitation, it, in the middle of the night in my terms. You know, if for most people, that would be like being woken up at about uh, at about midnight is, is the about the equivalent. You know, if someone woke you up at midnight and said, come on, let's go. And I went with it, and with with it, oh, hesitation, and, and played it the whole way back, because, oh my god, it was FF6, and it was properly remade. Now, there's one topic I've been avoiding this entire time, and that is the villain, Kefka. I have heard a lot of arguments, uh, a lot of discussions, and a lot of debates about who is the best villain in FF history, right? Now, of course, I, I usually tend to think, you know, well... They're all different villains of their own pluses and their own minuses. But I don't mind a little competitive not thinking as long as it doesn't get to the point of detrimental, if that makes any sense. In other words, I like a discussion, not an argument. Now, Kefka, in, 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 in the discussive terms, was something unique. Still is, actually. There have been an extremely small number of video game villains, of villains in general, that reach for the Kefka ideal. And in fact, none of them have ever actually equaled Kefka, in my opinion. Not really. Kefka was a unique combination. He wasn't just crazy. You can't call Kefka crazy. That's wrong. He wasn't just insane. He wasn't just evil. He wasn't just powerful. He wasn't just unstable. He wasn't just power-hungry. He wasn't just nihilistic. And he was a very, very strange combination of all of these things. You don't see a villain that has that specific setup, that specific mixture of all of those things I just mentioned very often. You usually see someone who is, you know, very crazy or very insane or very evil or very nihilistic with, with hints of the others. You don't see someone who is almost a completely generic blend of all of the above in such a way that what you have is this ball of indescribable. I literally don't have a word. You have this ball of Kefka. And <laughs> this ball of Kefka is so Kefka that you don't you, you, you just lose words for it. It's hard to describe this creature, this this thing, this individual, this character to other people. And Kefka is himself, of course, one of the greatest crimes of all of of Gestal, because Gestal, uh, it is very heavily hinted that Kefka was was another Leo. In fact, it has been hinted many times and postulated. I agree with this theory that Kefka and Leo were probably brothers, and Kefka. Or at the very least, you know, friends, childhood friends, uh, which would be actually probably be more likely. I'm sorry, I meant brothers, not in the literal familial sense. Um, but but we're brethren. We're we're together. We're comrades. And K Kefka was the, the the test subject for this 
experiment, and it twisted him really, really badly, and he only got worse as time got on. And Gestal uh, basically kept him on, as he said to other people, to honor him for his previous service, which is why people like Leo and Celis put up with him, and the sol soldiers put up with him. But it is also worth noting, Kefka is probably why Leo refused a Magitek infusion, and it is also worth noting that Gestal probably fully endorsed Kefka, as long as Kefka was still loyal, because, strangely enough, Kefka was actually loyal to Gestal until Gestal tried to kill Kefka. How strange is that? And that's another thing, because, uh, you know, I, everything I just described, how many of the villains who have tried for the Kefka ideal have actually been genuinely loyal? You know what I mean? And it is worth noting that the very moment Gestalt turned on him, all that loyalty vanished, just like that, instantly, in a vapor. But it was just an interesting concept that he, he was genuinely, honestly loyal. He had many, many occasions when he could have completely screwed over... Um, Excuse me. He completely screwed. O he could have completely screwed over Geshtal and turned against him and betrayed him and gone off for his own ends, but didn't. Now, Kefka is also absolutely fascinating in several other ways. Number one, uh, I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent here, really quick. Okay, there is a trope called complete monster. I personally disagree with the way they um, they place that. They they uh, there are a lot of villains listed on the complete monster list that I don't think deserve to be there because the way I personally des define a complete monster is someone who is the furthest end, someone who is the who is completely unredeemable, who is nothing good there at all. There's nothing likable there at all. All you want is the for this horrible horrible being to be destroyed as quickly and utterly as possible. Now, the reason I mention that in specific to this, is because I've argued many, many times that Kefka is not a complete monster. And there's several reasons for this. One, Kefka is, ironically enough, ultimately sympathetic. We get a lot of hinting, and especially in, in the, the supplemental material, that Kefka was a decent person before this experiment changed him into this and caused him to become like this. And it's also worth noting that it, Kefka himself does have character growth throughout the, seri throughout the series, just kind of the opposite of what the players do, or the player characters do. You know, Kefka has this experiment and completely warps and twists him, and then he starts to sh slide in the opposite direction, where everyone else slowly builds themselves up, slowly realizes life is worth living. Kefka does the exact opposite, becomes truly nihilistic, becomes truly uh, abyssal, and definitely wants to, to wipe out all life, including his own, and thinks that is actually the correct path, that is the proper way to go things. You know, he... <laughs> you, you follow what I'm saying here? And he... Uh, uh, so, so to to get back to my point, you know, he is a sympathetic villain, uh, is, including for his character growth, because that also wasn't actually his fault. It was just the way he he, he was twisted. He started looking things in the opposite manner. There's another thing that I'll, I'll discuss last here. Um, oh my! And so he was sympathetic, which which gets rid of the complete monster by itself. But let's keep going. He was amusing. Any complete, any villain who is amusing, who is entertaining, who is the kind of villain who, and this is hard to describe, even though you hate them, even though they are horrible, terrible human beings or whatever, even though they are atrocious creatures and indefinitely evil, because Kefka was without question evil, you nevertheless cheered every time he went on the screen. Every time he was there, you saw him and you cheered and you were like, yes, it's Kefka. And he had his own theme and he had his own freaking laugh. Uh, i, I got to mention the laugh as well because Kefka having his own sound effect devoted to him really spoke to how much effort they were putting into this character. Just felt like mentioning that really quick. But he was the kind of character who you don't want to die horribly and quickly as possible. You want to see more of him and you definitely you want to defeat him, but you get what I'm saying here. And uh, actually, that's all I got. But those are the, the big reasons why I think Kefka is not a complete monster. But on top of that, there are a couple other things I want to mention here with regards to this villain and, and the way he was presented in the game. Kefka was very much the Darth Vader of Final Fantasy VI. You saw him early. In fact, he is actually the very first character you see in the entire game. While the intro, if you let the intro run right at the very beginning, as it's doing the little, you know, here's what happened a thousand years ago thing, the first character you see ever, for about a second, is Kefka walking through Vector on the Imperial Palace. He is there from day one, literally, and they did that on purpose, and they did that deliberately. They wanted to get that point across right at the right there, right there one. This is Kefka. This is how it starts. So much of the plot revolves around Kefka and how he is, and I'll get to that in a moment. 
but he he grows he on uh, both in terms of power and, and accessibility throughout the case of the game in the same way that the players do because he keeps getting more magical infusions because he keeps draining more espers and taking their essence throughout the course of the game you know when you first encounter Kefka as a fight he is so pathetic that anyone could defeat him he it, it's the point is getting across that he is fleeing for his life because he is pathetic compared to you and you're nowhere at this point you're like level 15 or whatever maybe 20 if you're, you've been leveling a lot you know that's it Kefka is a joke to you and so he has to flee and hide behind his soldiers and he has to poison the castle and you know blah 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 the very next time you encounter him which is not too long later he has received additional infusions and is actually a worthwhile boss at this point and you and you learn more about him uh, just in little bits and pieces there about how he is actually enthusiastic about the thought of going after Celis and he's actually in, in looking forward to wiping this out and then he immediately switches into murder psychotic mode and just says go kill them all right now and you really see those shifts in Kefka a lot really showing the fact that in my opinion Kefka is trying all the way up until when you encounter him in the world of ruin. Every time you see him in the world of balance, with, with actually the one exception, Kefka is trying to make life worth living, if you understand what I'm saying. He is trying to find some way to to get joy out of life, as he sees others do, and he knows others do, but it just doesn't work for him because he's twisted, because he's wrong, and so he doesn't enjoy life, and he keeps trying to. He keeps putting up this mask of the clown. You know, he wears the outfit of the clown. He tr he laughs at everything. He's trying to constantly make jokes about things and ah, <laughs> you know, play the Joker thing. But the truth of the matter is, all of that is a lie. All of that is him attempting to 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 extract something out of life that that he isn't, that he isn't succeeding at, and it gets more and more desperate at it as it goes on, and it gets to the point where he starts getting more and more towards the psychotic part. He stops being, he stops playing the clown, and just starts being more of the 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 monster, the the creature, not complete monster, but definitely a monster. You know, he just starts being more and more of that as the game goes on. Until finally, you know, when you encounter him at Thamasa, he has grown not only in terms of power, but as a character to the point where he no longer bothers to put up the, the, the mask at all. He just laughs emptily, without the sound effect, I might add, at how easy it is for him to completely wipe out an entire group of espers. That's how powerful he's gotten, and that's how far he's fallen as a character, as an individual. He is at the point now where it's just meaningless to him, and he just takes all their power, and he's like, all right, let's go. And... You finally get to the point, of course, where he, he gets sufficiently pissed off at Celis that he seeks to destabilize the, the, the statues in order because of his anger, because of his hatred, because to him, wiping out the world to take out someone who has hurt him makes perfect sense, because at this point in time, Kefka is already completely gone. Anything that ever was there, as far as a mask, as far as a remnant, as far as any memories of what was before, is fully abolished at this point. At this point, all we have is something that thinks only of destruction and death, and thought nothing of going ahead and wiping out the world in order to take out a woman who stabbed him. I, I know I want to stress this isn't a, an example of of over exaggeration. This isn't an example of of you know trying to emphasize a point in a ridiculous way. This is actually how he thought. This was actually a major plot point. The depth he was willing to go for such a minor offense. This was obsession to its greatest degree and extremism without re, without restraint and without re, uh, uh, moderation. This was what Kefka really was. And he had embraced that fully as of that moment. And when you finally encounter him in the world of ruin, he lays it all out for you without hesitation, without rancor. He's just saying, it's all wrong. None of it matters. I'm just going to destroy everything. I'm going to take my time about doing it because I'm going to try and enjoy it. I'm failing, but I'm going to try to enjoy destroying your stupid world and then create this monument to non-existence. That's Kefka. Now... There is a reason for all of this, in my opinion. In all of Final Fantasy VI, what we have is a situation where every character, every character in the entire game has a bond of friendship or family or some form of love or camaraderie or like-mindedness or whatever with other people. Whatever the species, whatever the situation, Esper, Moogle, you know, Sasquatch, or human, whatever. They're all connected one to another some way, somehow, and they all have someone. You know, th that message I was telling you earlier, you are not alone. 
there's one exception to that, and that is Kefka. In a world and a game so much about the, the strength of unity and bonds of friendship and fellowship, Kefka was completely and utterly alone. He had no one. Even Geshtal had someone, had several someone. Even Leo had someone. You know, Sid had people. Kefka had no one, no friends, no loyalty to him, no minions, no nothing. Kefka had nothing. He had only opponents and people who hated him and Geshtal who used him. And it is really a powerful moment. It is really a powerful expression when you create a villain whose entire purpose from a narrative and theatrical perspective is to highlight the exact extreme opposite of what your entire story is about. Kefka is the opposite of Final Fantasy VI, and that's one of the reasons why he is such an effective villain in that game, is because he is everything the game is not. He is the absolute furthest end extreme, and there's a reason why he is the central core of FF6 in its own way. He is why all of FF6 happens, is because he is so far removed from what FF6 actually is as a, as a piece, as a work of art, that it all revolves around him to some extent or another. It could be argued quite strongly that, F that Kefka is the primary character of Final Fantasy VI for good reason because of this, it was an incredibly powerful move to do that, and no other villain has done something to such a degree and such an extent, even in the Final Fantasies. Other great villains, don't mistake me. And this is ultimately why I will go ahead and put my stamp on saying that Kefka is the greatest FF villain ever done, because they bothered to create him in such a manner that he emphasized the entire game by himself. And it was incredibly powerful. Like I said earlier, when the when the when the the party all shares with him all the reasons that they've learned through the world of balance and most especially in the world of ruin, all their bonds, all their friendship, all their fellowship, and Kefka listens. He doesn't ignore them. He doesn't make fun of them. He takes it in and he thinks to himself, and none of it makes sense because Kefka has never had any of that, and all he sees is something with no worth, and so he he yells at them, and says, "All right, enough." You have shown me, in his actions, he, he states this, even though he doesn't actually say it outright. You have shown me that it's time to actually wipe out this world. Enough is enough. We're going to kill everything now. And that's when the last boss fight starts. And this is one of the reasons that fight should have been so much more, because that was, uh, un in several cases, you have a circumstance where the last boss, if you lose there, oh well, you know, because you'll die, of course, and several people will die, but the world will go on because of the one-winged angel clause, as I mentioned before. This is an example very much of the opposite of that. If you didn't stop Kefka right then and there, he was actively going to start destroying the world the second you fell over. He was going to wipe out everything you had fought for and strove for and knew and loved and ever everything that all ever would have been and all that ever was. He was just going to wipe the board clean the moment he was done with you, and you had to stop him for that. No, I think I'm... Finally, finally ready to go ahead and stop. It's such a shame. I was going to do FF7 and FF8 right now, but I get off work in half an hour. And so I'm going to go do some paperwork. And, uh, yeah. I would apologize here, but of all the games that I would want to review, and all the games that deserve this level of, of complexity and depth and reviewing, this is at the top of the list for me. Final Fantasy VI is the greatest game ever made for me. It is a game that fits me and who I am and what I am in every possible facet. And I love that game. Ironically. And I would highly recommend it to anyone. Now, I'm going to go do some paperwork. So I will see you guys Thursday.